You're going out every day, you get in a gunfight outside of your fob. Then you come home, and then you got to deal with the base getting hit. How many engagements would you say you were a part of in that eight months? Do you have any idea? I lost count, it was that many. Just to put that in perspective for you, because most guys don't think about this, that's 180 fucking engagements. Our very first op, the helo crashed. Oh shit. Killed everybody. One guy survived. I want to take a call. I have your dad on the line, Jim. Hey Jim, how's it going? This is Sean Ryan. I was just always curious how he really felt when you actually landed in Afghanistan with the team for that first appointment. I kind of just in the back of my mind hoped that you understood or at least somewhat understood what I was actually going to do. Yeah, that was definitely an emotional day for me. I didn't like, I still remember that call clearly. I, I didn't want to bet on to him how, how emotional it was. Fucking every night, right when sundown, these dudes would just smash us with small arms and they would, it would be effective. A lot of times when you lose guys in a combat zone and you know them, it'll create a type of ritual did I do anything? I'm gonna take another call. We got a mutual friend on the line who was there that whole second deployment with you, Jeff Reed. Dude, I am doing great. How are you doing? And there's a picture of you and Jeff and another guy's face that's blurred out. Do you ever shoot the goose nuts off on that mount up at the mountain? Hell yeah, I do. Welcome back to the Sean Ryan Show. I hope everybody had a good Christmas, good holiday, a good new year. We released our first episode on midnight on Christmas Eve out of 800,000 podcasts and an estimated 30 million episodes. We ranked number 73 on the top charts overall right off the bat. Thanks to you guys for heading over to iTunes, listening, subscribing, and most importantly, leaving us a review. If you get a chance and you haven't done it yet, please go over to iTunes, leave us a review, even if it's only one word. That's all I'm asking for doing these. With that being said, I'm ready to kick off episode 002. We have a 13-year combat veteran Navy SEAL with multiple combat deployments. He was a BUDS instructor. This one really strums the heartstrings. We get deep. It gets emotional. Guys, this is better than entertainment. This is the real thing. Please welcome Mr. Travis Kennedy. Travis, I've been dying to meet you. You're finally here in Tennessee. We're in my studio. I can't fucking wait to get started. Jeff Reed introduced us, what, a couple months back over the phone. And um, anybody that's a friend of that guy is a friend of mine. And uh, I just want to say it's a real pleasure to finally meet you and, and to have you on the show. Thank you, man. Yeah, it's been a long time coming for sure. Uh, True pleasure to even be sitting right here and spending the weekend with you. So yeah. Thank you, man. Yeah, that's, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. I want to dive right in here and I'm going to give you a tough question. Right now, the hot topic on the news is Iran. We just killed Soleimani. And without going too far in depth into your background yet, you're a team guy, you're a SEAL, you're an operator, you've been on multiple bases, maybe embassies, FOBs, but you've been on government facilities in combat zones that have been hit numerous times. I want to hear your take on our president's decision to fire up that drone strike and take out Soleimani. Yeah, that's been a definitely a controversial topic, at least from what I've seen um, lately. However, my opinion is that these decisions aren't made rationally. They're not made hasty. They're very strategic and thought out, especially with a guy like Soleimani. 
this is someone that's been on our list for a very long time. So the president had to make a difficult decision, but a decision that, in my opinion, needed to be done. Um, and at the end of the day, we're getting rid of a terrorist that has been responsible for hundreds of thousands, close to thousands of deaths, you know, Iraqis and American lives. So we're doing the world a favor by getting rid of this guy. Yeah, yeah we maybe there is always risk on the table, and these these decisions are made every single day. Some don't even come to the spotlight, but all these risks are weighed; they're not just made blindly. So, yeah, I mean, as a guy that's 13-year Navy SEAL, multiple combat deployments, well over 100 engagements, <clears throat> fighting off terrorists that are trying to kill you, I mean, what? What is it like to hear people say that they're upset that we killed a guy who's responsible for thousands of U.S. lives, and uh, you know, and and they don't support it. They don't. They don't think that we should have uh, retaliated. And and me personally, I had friends that died in Benghazi, and we saw what the fuck happened when we don't do anything, when we don't send help, and when we don't, you know, um, stand up for our guys that are over there fighting for the fucking freedom that these Americans have at home. Yeah, it's, it's really, honestly, it's truly mind-blowing. I try to ignore stuff like that, um, all these people online, but it's hard to miss, especially with this. Uh, it's the reaction of people getting mad because he may stoke another war or another conflict with Iran, with Iran. We've already been in conflict with Iran for a very long time. We'll still continue to be. We have no good relations with them. They're not a friendly country whatsoever. But, so, but just one incident because it's been blowing up so much and most likely because he's such a high-level guy that people want to go high and right knee-jerk reaction and think, you know, this was so horrible that he was going to cause a war possibly. But I think people just need to understand and educate themselves on why these decisions are made. Because decisions like these are made all the time. Yeah. And they just don't, people don't know about it. Yeah. Um, but I just hate, I hate seeing online, I hate seeing people going uproar over stuff like this. Yeah. I think, you know, it seems like. You know, you'd know, never hear anybody who actually did anything for the country speaking out against things like this. It's always the people that are sitting on their fucking ass back in the rear enjoying the freedom that we fucking give them. And, uh, you know, maybe those people should just shut the fuck up and enjoy what they have. Exactly. You know? But, all right, enough about politics. I hate them. I get pissed every time I talk about them. <laughs> but... Uh, I want to dive right into your childhood and, uh, you know, kind of where you grew up and, and how you grew up and, and, and eventually what led you to become one of the world's most elite operators as a Navy SEAL. So, where did you grow up? So, growing up in Southern California, grew up in a city called Huntington Beach. Um, it's a beach town, living in California. I mean, I was just a punk kid growing up, you know, a skateboarder, just doing shenanigans at a younger age, uh, bouncing back and forth between mom and dad. Uh, they were divorced, typical, you know, broken home, um, sharing time. When did they get divorced? I don't even remember. It, I was an infant. I mean, I was so young, I can't even remember when they were divorced. Uh, I can't remember when they were married. <laughs> it was that long ago. Okay, so, so you, you never I've never, saw them I've never together. even experienced living or at least from what I did at one point when I was a baby, but even remembering living with them in the same household, married. So I grew up like that. It was a normal, for, that was a normal for me. But so going back and forth between mom and dad growing up um, was normal. It was a pain in the ass. Uh, I actually liked spending more time with my mom than I did my dad when I was younger. Really? And I have no idea why. Even looking back, I was just, I, I like to call myself an idiot. Because now me and my dad are like, we're, su we're me, mom and dad are super close, but me and my dad are super tight. But I think it was because at the time, my mom was dating someone who had a son. He was a little bit older than me, and we were like brothers. Okay. Did everything together, always hung out, we were skateboarding, 
always fucking off. So naturally I was inclined just to wanting to be there all the time. Um, so never wanted to go to my dad's. I did, but not often without bitching. That's surprising to me because I've researching you on social media and listening to your previous podcast, I can tell that you're, you and your father are extremely tight. My question is, if you were so tight with your mom, what is the thing that kind of um, drew you closer to your father? As I got older? Yeah. I think as I matured more, I just kind of realized that he was my father, you know, as a father figure, and I just wanted to be around him more. You know, I was like probably around 14, 13, 14. Uh, I wanted to spend more time with him. Um, and we became closer because my mom was just dating this guy. They ended up separating. So that older, his son, we all like parted ways. Uh -huh. So that kind of got broken up. Um, so then I was kind of left with without him. And then I just kind of leaned towards, kind of naturally just went towards my dad. Okay. Um, and we became a lot tighter. I spent a lot more time with him, especially when I was in, once I hit middle school and then going into high school. Um, but still the same thing, s still sharing time throughout the whole process. What were you like as a kid? Were you, were you like a nerd? Were you studying, making good grades, or were you a hellion out yeah, terrorizing up, the town? Growing up, I was like a, a punk kid younger, like middle school, uh, just a punk skateboarder. Just doing shenanigans, fucking around. I was I was a mediocre student in elementary, mid school, middle school, uh, junior high. Uh, probably just mediocre. I didn't really try that hard in school. Um, I was more focused on, especially when I was younger, just fucking off. And then towards the end of, I would say middle school, going to high school, and then I started, I started tightening up. I was never really a, a overachiever in school as far as grades are concerned. But I got into sports and that kind of changed my mentality. Uh, it wasn't really until I got into high school and started playing like lacrosse and started in a couple other sports that I really started maturing. Okay. Kind of seeing what the next move was in life. You know, I heard uh, on some of your other podcasts as well, they assumed that you were from a great family, it sounded like. And uh, I think I heard one say like, you know, oh, you know, a lot of guys that go into special operations or even the military are from broken families. And you didn't say a fucking word. They just breezed right over it. And um, <clears throat> my wife actually picked up on that first. And so you're not from a picture perfect family in Huntington Beach, California, like Absolutely. everybody thinks. You <laughs> had some shit. Yeah, most people think, and it's fine that people from SoCal, or especially those beach cities, because they are wealthy cities, you know, born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Yeah. Got everything I had, perfect family, everything, all our shit together. Far from it. Uh, we were good, but definitely not normal family. Uh, broken home, that, but that was normal for me. Uh, so I was used to it. Mm -hmm. Maybe if it happened later in life, it probably would have ha had more of a profound effect on me. But being that it was, and I was such a young age, not even realizing, I, that was just normal. I yeah. mean, I was just so used to it. It didn't really have a ne really too much of a negative effect on me, them, my parents being separated. Uh, but yeah, definitely, we were just lower middle class family, like in just did struggles. My dad was struggling, starting his own business, poor, but still providing, you know, my mom, same thing. So definitely, Definitely not the the typical what you think of uh, Southern California, that's for sure. At what point did you start to realize you wanted to become a Navy SEAL or join the military? How old were you? I was about 16, 15 going on 16. That I knew I wanted to be in the military because in the beginning, when I started weighing all these options, I knew I wanted to be military, and then I was really sat down, like, what do I want to do? I want to do something above the norm. Like, I didn't want to just join and be a grunt or just the regular sailor. I was more focused on Navy. 
And I just wanted to join and just be on the ship and just do whatever job. I wanted to do something great. Uh, I did at the time think about Naval Academy. So I was talking, this time I was discussing with my father what I should do. At first he wanted me to do college. And he knew it, and then he's like, Navy, think about Naval Academy. I thought about fighter pilot. That thought came in and out of my head pretty quickly. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think it was more of this, like the stigma was like, oh, that sounds great, that sounds fun, you know, that sounds like a cool job. But the whole Naval Academy, that just wasn't for me. And honestly, now being an officer was that my personality, so I'm glad I didn't do that. <laughs> but <laughs> fucking cake eaters. Yeah, that would not. That's not me. Then I, f you know, going on with SEALs, my father was a big influencer, major influencer for the SEALs, you know. He's the one, and I, you've heard this in other podcasts, that he, he's the one that brought the, the information home for me. Because at the time, there was minimal. Mm -hmm. Minimal information online or whatsoever. You know, he brought home a pamphlet, like those little trifold pamphlets that had seals, all little blips of information, not much, but just like this is Navy S SEALs. And I was like, holy shit, you know, like that was it. Um, especially him giving it to me. Uh, that was more of maybe a subconscious thing for me. Like I, at the time I look back and like maybe that was, you know, seeing him give me this, like, hey, you need to be doing something great. Yeah. Like that set the tone. That's pretty surprising. You don't hear that very often about their parents push their kid into special operations. I think that's cool, but you just, you don't hear that ever. Yeah, I've never and, heard uh, it. It's very surprising. What, did you know, I mean, when he gave you the pamphlet, what that was or what that would entail? I knew what they were, but I didn't know what it entailed. I mean, I've heard of them, uh, but just vaguely, I didn't know all that, like just a glimpse into that kind of pamphlet thing of what they're about. Because at the time before that, I didn't research them. I didn't, I mean, I've heard of it on like a little bit, but that, once I got that in my hands, then I dove deep, you know, I deep dived into it. Yeah. And I just became obsessed because even just looking at that, getting it from him, just and then reading it, I knew that was gonna be a good fit. That was more my style, who I was, my personality, where I would see I would fit, and do good, and be successful. Um, and after that, I was like, that's it, like that's what I'm gonna do. And the merit, especially with the the water aspect too, the because I really that's what drove me kind of the Navy, the maritime aspect, and that was like perfect. It was like seals would be perfect fit for me. You liked the water growing up. I agree. Yeah, I did. Do you like it now? I have a different relationship with it now. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of guys have a different relationship with that after a round. Takes me about 10 minutes to get in the water now. <laughs> you just look at it like, oh, fuck, I hope it's Slow not cold. Slow crawl into it. And... <laughs> you signed up at 17 years old. I mean, you can't even legally do that by yourself. What was that like? And, and why didn't you just wait till you were 18? Yeah, I mean, for me, I knew in my core that I wanted to do this so bad. I was like, I need to sign up, make this happen. Because that, when I did that, that even stoked the fire even more because now I had that goal. I already made that commitment and there was no turning back in my mind. Yeah. Um, but I was so set in that time because I I'd enlisted this summer going into my senior year because I wanted to graduate and go. So you enlisted before your out. fucking senior year of high school? Yeah, so I was already in in the Navy, the debt program throughout my senior year. So I knew for a fact I was going. I already knew when I was leaving for boot camp, like halfway through senior year. Holy shit. I left literally a month later, after I graduated high school one month later. Wow, so looking back now, after all you've been through, did you, do you think you had any idea how big of a fucking decision that was that you made at 17 years old? to go, <laughs> and then this is post 9-11. What year is this? 06. 06. So yeah, post 9-11. So no, <laughs> I definitely, I, I knew I was making a major commitment because I knew SEAL Special Forces, like this is big time, dude. this is, but being at a young age, like just knowing the minimal knowledge I knew about it, I didn't know the magnitude. I mean, that was way bigger. Um, I didn't really, it didn't really come to life till I actually got there. Wow. Um, but I definitely knew I was making a life-changing decision, um, a difficult one, 
hell of a, chal a challenging one too, but the magnitude didn't really hit me until I actually got to Buds, and that's when reality struck. But I knew what I wanted to do. That's why I joined so early because I wanted to leave right away. Yeah. I didn't want to. I don't want buffer time because I, I knew myself was like if I drag this out, then this, I'm gonna create excuses or something. Yeah. Because my I locked tight my training like over a year out when I enlisted, I was like so 100% front side focused. You were locked on. For, locked on like 100% training on that thing. Decision. That was my life. I didn't give a shit about anything else. Like, I I played a little bit of sports that helped me, and then trained, and then was I didn't care about. It. I finished school, passed. I wasn't exceptional. Cause I was so, all I care about was seals. A's, B's, C's, or below on your grades? No A's. I got like a B, couple B's, C's, and a D in math. I wasn't a math student. I got like a D in math. <laughs> not a math guy. And now, actually, believe it or not, decent at math now. But at the time, I think, cause I, I think I just didn't put effort into it. I don't know why, but I. Just, the interest wasn't there. I was so focused on something else. Yeah. So how long after graduation did you go to boot camp? Graduated in June of 06. Went to Bud's, or excuse me, boot camp in July. You went to boot later. camp? Did went you? to boot camp in July. I graduated high school in June. So a month later, I left for boot camp in July of 06. And then boot camp is boot camp. And then I... Went to core school after boot camp. No oh, shit. I joined July of 01. That's weird. <laughs> yeah, but, July 18th was the day I went there. Wow. <laughs> when you joined, you so you joined, you had the SEAL contract or whatever they were calling it at that time. And at that time, did they have, did they make you go through uh, an A school to fill the, a job of the Navy if you quit? Or did you go straight to BUDS? Yeah, they did. I had to pick a rate. I had to pass the SEAL PST before I, I got to try out for BUDS prior to even boot camp. And then I had to pick a rate. I ended up picking core school because at the time there was only an approved list. It wasn't any job in the Navy. They gave me a list like of five jobs like ordinance, radar, core school. And I looked at it, I was like, uh, maybe I'll just pick something that's practical. You yeah. know, that's going to be useful in my life, medicine. So you did that? Yeah, I had no, I had no idea like I would be interested in it. I just sounded it's like okay, medicine. That sounds more useful than an AO or something that loads just ordinance on ships. Yeah. So I picked that, and that kind of paved the way. How old were you when you got to Buds? Nineteen. Nineteen 18, years old. Yeah, I turned nineteen. Yeah. So you did all this preparation from age sixteen. You made that decision, 17, 17 you signed. really locked tight, yeah. You get to Bud's. Did you think you were prepared when you showed up? I did. Were you prepared when you showed up? I thought I was. <laughs> I mean, I, everything up until that point, I really thought I was. did everything I can, had all the tools, thought I knew everything I needed to know about training and to be physically and mentally ready, um, but once I actually started Buds, I knew there was things that I wasn't ready for. I mean, it was going to be a surprise. Yeah. You know, things you just can't train for. What was that like for you? I mean, you'd seen, I'm, I'm assuming you watched every damn piece of content you could get your hands on. Discovery Channel, History yeah. Channel, books, whatever you could get your hands on. <clears throat> and so you thought you knew the whole process. You saw it all on, you know, or what you thought you saw it all, and then you're there, and you see the bell, and you see the grinder, and you see the instructors, and you see the classes. They're already classed up, going through Hell Week, second phase, third phase. What, what was that like when you showed up and you saw all that shit for real for the first time? Definitely nerve-wracking. It was a surreal experience. So I remember checking in. I checked in with like a handful of other guys, and we walked into the quarter deck checked in and then they marched us through the grinder and there was a class going on the grinder getting beat or doing a PT. Um, that was definitely a surreal experience for me. Nervous as hell, scared. Um, also very excited too. Like I had all kinds of emotions in me. I yeah. didn't know how to act. Just stoic face, but internally I was, cause I was just like this frail, skinny, 
19 year old out of boot camp lost so much weight so i was just like i look probably so i look so damn young yeah but i didn't like i said prior to that point i thought i knew i was gonna get myself into it until i saw it and i was like holy shit you know here it is <laughs> yeah you see yeah you see guys that are mid-20s early 30s yeah, because I saw first phase guys, see like second, third phase guys running around. He's like brown shirts. These dudes got long hair, look like, you know, more mature, older. Like, fuck, you know, it's taken back. Yeah, shit. Some of them have already been to combat and back from other branches and decided they want to try out for a seal. Yep. And you're a 19 year old punk kid yeah. from Huntington Beach, California. I mean, did you, did that intimidate you seeing guys like that quit? It didn't intimidate me. I didn't really notice it at first. I mean, I didn't really pay attention to people who quit. I was just, especially in the beginning, there was just so many of us that you wake up and there's lost like 10 guys. How know? many did you start with? We started around 140, I believe, something like that. And then I ended up graduating buds with 31, 32. Shit, so that's, uh... They say it's like an 85% attrition rate, yeah. and that's, I mean, well above that. So, <clears throat> must have been a tough true. class. <laughs> Last hardest class? Yeah, I hear that <laughs> all the time, too. When you showed up, whether it's selection or buds, a lot of, a lot of guys showing up to those kind of uh, training curriculums, they have one evolution, one famous evolution in mind that they're scared shitless of. Like a lot of guys who go to buds, it's the, you know, the 50 meter underwater swim or selection is the land nav. Did, did you have anything that you were really worried about? Me was the boats on heads. I saw it and didn't know how, I went to that point, like I knew I had to do four mile run. I knew I had to do the swim. I wasn't really sweating that. I heard about the 50 meter, uh, wasn't really sweating that, but seeing watching the videos and stuff like that i seen like the log pt and the guys sprinting with this boat on their head and i'm being right because that's in my opinion still the worst evolution in buds i mean it's definitely mentally and physically the most taxing um, running with that thing on your head especially when people around you aren't holding their weight in, in the beginning when you're all collectively hold putting holding your weight then it's manageable but when people start slipping then it's it's brutal. Uh, for me, that was one of the most challenging, in the beginning, probably one of the most challenging things. Was this, was that as bad as you thought it was going to be? The boats on heads? It was worse. Was it worse? <laughs> I yeah. didn't even know. I just saw it. I didn't even know how bad it was going to be. Those are the things you can't prepare for, like boats on heads, rock, I mean, log PT. You know, those, watching guys on the video, it just doesn't really do it justice. Yeah, it's a little bit different watching somebody with a rubber boat on their head and you're like, ah, you know, how bad that. can it be? <laughs> and then your head's under that boat with a bunch of sand in between your scalp and that boat that weighs, I don't know, a couple hundred pounds full of sand and water. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, it takes your scalp with it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it crushes your neck. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's an eye opener for sure. Did the thought of quitting ever cross your mind going Never. through? Never once. No, and I can honestly say that. No, never thought about it one time. No shit. Definitely struggled through through buds on on certain physical evolutions and challenged definitely a lot. But the thought of giving up, no. What did you struggle with? Running. Running. Yeah. Running was my kryptonite. As it progressed, in the beginning it was okay, and then it got progressively a little worse and worse, and then kind of set me back did it did you get rolled back or second phase I got rolled back for runs oh shit how was that did that just crush your mindset yeah I was embarrassed for sure especially over runs I just felt like what the fuck Travis like over fucking runs this is what we do you know I maybe I would have take, taken it better if I like failed pool, pool competency or something like that or a dive um, because that's a difficult task but a four mile time run that I've been doing for the past eight weeks or longer um, I thought I would 
I, w I never would have saw myself failing runs because I failed one before pool comp, past pool comp, failed another one after pool comp, which is a major milestone in the second phase. And then I ended up getting rolled back into another class. But post pool comp, so I didn't have to do that all over again. For you civilian types, pool comp is a major hurdle in BUDS, which is SEAL training. And basically, uh, long story short, it's scuba diving. You're with open circuit tanks and um, you have to go under and basically what happens is you get the shit beat out of you and you can't breathe and you have to go through all these procedures before you can resurface and get air. Did you have to do that over again? No. Thank God. No, that's <laughs> Thank that's God. Good. That was a that was a tough evolution. Yeah. Too. That was probably one of the toughest I did in MUDs, if not the toughest. Um, but I luckily got to be able to roll back post that. So I classed up with another class uh, and then finished buds with that class. No more hang ups. No more hang ups. Actually came back stronger and healthier. And I wasn't even rolled back for that long, month, month and a half. Okay. Um, so not very long. But I came back stronger and healthier. Yeah. So I just focused on, I trained, I rehabbed my body. Because I just, I still felt a little broken down too after Hell Week, first phase. Um, but. So maybe that was a blessing in disguise. I don't know, but I was I was still ashamed of myself. Like I didn't want to fail and then see my first my class pass yeah. me up, which is a, sh a shitty feeling too. So you graduate buds, you go to SDT, and then just doing the research, I already know you became a medic. You went to 18 Delta course, correct? Yeah. And Fort Bragg. That's a hard thing to do because that's a long course. And so the guys that you were in buds with are already at the team. Some of them are already going off to war and you're still in the schoolhouse. Yeah. How was that? That was definitely being a corpsman already. Right when I got my bird, they just immediately pointed at me like, hey, you're going to 18 Delta. Mm -hmm. or SOCOM, which is the Special Operations Combat Medic, the short course of the 18 Delta. It's six months. Um, still very long course. And yeah, I was kind of like taken back. I was like, okay, you know, not really knowing what the hell that was really. Uh, and still, I was a little irritated because yeah. I was eager to go to the team and start working and get out of the, the student kind of mindset and actually show up to the team and start doing the job and training with the other other team guys. But I took it on the chin, uh, said, let's go. Uh, and, and I went, but we'll get into it. But it was the best course I've ever attended in my entire career. Really? Yeah. Just backtracking just a second. Get through buds. I mean, I know how influential your dad was in your life. And he originally gave you that pamphlet, which was the initial idea of you becoming a Navy SEAL. At the end of SQT, which uh, is SEAL qualification training, when you got your trident, how good did that feel? Knowing that your dad, I mean, he must have been yeah, so proud. Yeah, that was an incredible feeling. I mean, not only for me, I know for him, he was there, um, so was the rest of my family. He got to see. He did, yeah. You get pinned. He did, yeah. He was there. That's so it awesome. So it was really cool to have him there, and my, the rest of my family as well, mom, sister. So that was an unbelievable. Best feeling I ever had. Best feeling of my life. Um, number one moment in my life up to this point. So and everything coming to fruition, after all those kind of steps leading up to this point, and now it's actually coming true. Um, was great yeah, and I knew it was great for him too because you know he could just see the, the result. That must have been really cool. Yeah. So you're at 18 Delta School, you're a little bit pissed off because the boys are at the team already, you're in the schoolhouse, an army schoolhouse nonetheless which is always kind of a pain in the ass for um, <laughs> to do the cross thing with the with other branches. 
and I know how frustrating that must have been, but looking back now, now that you know the medic is probably the most important job on the team, would you have changed anything? No. No, like I said, it's, I became passionate about medicine. Like that's where I fell in love with it there at the school. I didn't, even after core school, I didn't know shit about it. I mean, they just teach you bare bones. And then actually deep dive into this course, uh, I developed a love for it and a passion for it. And I enjoyed every minute of it. And it, it definitely, I do not regret it because it paid dividends throughout my entire career. Everywhere you go, you need a medic. Every op, you need a medic. And there I was, the guy that's a medic, because there's not many medics in the far few in between the platoons, because no one wants to go, because it's too long, too hard. Uh, but being at Bragg, where the schoolhouse is located, an Army base, massive, and it's joint command, so a bunch of different units, majority mar Army, but there's a bunch. Uh, Navy guys definitely stood out, and we're under the microscope for sure. Uh, and it really important to me to perform because I didn't want to be, I've heard horror stories at that point. Like I didn't want to be the team guy showing up to the platoon saying he failed 18 Delta. Just yeah. straight up turd. That's the first impression. I don't want to be that guy. They're expecting you to be a, a medic and show up here. And as soon as you do that, you're screwing over the platoon yeah. essentially. And you know, now you just look bad as an, a seal and as a, a man. So, I definitely didn't want that. Um, I wanted to crush it. How did you do in that course? I mean, that's a probably, that's got to be one of the most academically challenging courses in the military, going through 18 Delta. I mean, it's, I mean, it's so much information condensed into what, six, seven months? Yeah. Yeah, it was the most challenging course academically. Um, I ended up surprising myself. I ended up graduating that course as honor man in my class. Um, no shit. Which I kind of blew my own myself away doing that because I never graduated honor man anything before that. Yeah. <laughs> but after graduating that class, finished honor man because I, leading up to that point, like I said, I, I was passionate about it. I loved doing. It. I wanted to be a good medic because it was important to me. Um, it was damn near like being in college, even though I never had college experience up to that point, but it was like being in college. I was in the books 24 7, seven days a week, learning the shit in and out. Especially in the, the first three months, first half of the course. The second half is when you actually get to do the real stuff, the live tissue training, surgical skills, TCCC. So it was a gut check for sure for me, but again, I. And part of the motivation was too, I wanted to outdo the army. Yeah. Because up before that, it's always like some army guy getting honor man or outdoing the Navy guys because there was only like six of us. So I took it upon myself. I was like, you know what? I'm going to show them what SEALs are all about. We're fucking, we need to, we need to dominate here because we're such on the microscope all the time. That's always a pain in the ass <laughs> doing, uh, any type of school with a, yeah. with a different branch because of that competitiveness or com it, what's the word I'm looking for? You're under the microscope as other units and there's a, the pissing contest between the two. Yeah, pissing match. Pissing match with all the branches, you know, and they see you, especially if there's only a few of you, you know, we always hung out together and then when we we're in ranks every morning there, we're all segregated and there's only a little small unit of us and. I mean, all this staff there hated the Navy guys. It never goes smoothly, that's for fucking sure. Yeah. But but you graduated Honor Man, which is kind of funny considering you were a subpar student in high school. You're still, I mean, you're only a couple years older now in, in 18 Delta school, correct? Mm -hmm. And you graduate Honor Man. That's, I mean, that's fucking impressive. Yeah, I was 21 when I finished. Oh no shit. Yeah, I turned 21 while I was there at the end. So you graduate 18 Delta, you're a combat medic, you're showing up to SEAL Team 4. You show up to SEAL Team 4. I mean, that's a lot of schooling and preparation for a kid to go through. You're finally at SEAL Team 4, 21 years old. What was that like? Yeah, that was a long time coming. I mean, towards the end of that, 
once I graduated, the schoolhouse even asked me, like, you got honor man? And since you got honor man, we want to offer you to stay longer. Like, hey, you want to stay f- for an additional seven months and be up, be here for over a year <laughs> 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 to do the long course? They call it the long course. And at the time, I was like, no. I was like, I want to go to the team. Mm-hmm. So that's how hungry I was at that point. I was ready. Yeah. Um, ready to finally be there and do the job. I was finally, I was prepared. I knew medicine to be a good medic and I was ready just to actually do the, to be a SEAL. Because when you're at Sockham, the med school, you're just, all you are is inundated with medicine. You're not learning anything SEALs, operators at all. It's just 100% medicine. Okay. Which it has to be that way to make you a good medic. So you're, you get removed a little bit. Yeah. So I was so eager to go to a team and just start operating. Like I wanted to be a SEAL. So I was ready. I was ready to get after it. What was it like walking in the platoon hut that first time? I mean, I know you showed up to SEAL Team 4. I know you jumped in a platoon that was coming back from war. And here you are, green, probably overly motivated, as most new guys are. Mm-hmm. And these guys are coming home from, was it Iraq? Yeah, I was going to one troop. These dudes were in Iraq. Um, and they were just on like their last month of being there, about to be coming home. And they were getting it over there. Yeah. And majority of those guys have already been there two times, some three. So was that intimidating for you? And- Very intimidating. Because I was only, at the time, I was going only, me and the couple other new guys were the only ones going into one troop, which was the CENTCOM plat- troop, the guys that were getting out, going to war. So you knew as soon as you showed up, yes. you were going to war. I was going to one troop, Iraq, which is responsible for the AO CENTCOM. So I knew inevitably I was going to go to Iraq. That was kind of in the back of our mind. They didn't say for sure at that time when I first checked in, but I knew I was going to one troop. It's happening. It's happening. That's where I'll be going in the future. And definitely nerve wracking. Uh, I was a super intimidated to even go and be going to SEAL Team 4. And then let alone like going to the platoon space, which is like sacred territory <laughs> for the old guys. You yeah. Know? So definitely nervous especially when they got there when they started trickling in and then because that when i first showed up it was like we got our gear we just got a locker quarter deck watch new guy duties you know just new guy stuff all the time so not really much of anything until they actually showed up and then they start showing up and then we actually get to see them you know these dudes are Vet, war veterans, man. These guys have been there, done that, and I'm just we're just over here, just new and green, yeah, not knowing shit. You know, just keep my mouth shut. Just I imagine then they probably weren't the most welcoming bunch of guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not, not at first. No, they were. They they didn't all show up at once. They kind of just all half came in, and the half, and they all trickled in. Um, they all went on leave pretty much almost immediately when they got back. But yeah, once once they saw us, it was just like blood in the water. So did you get to do a full train up before you went out the door or? Yeah, I did. Full workup. A full sure. workup. Yeah. That's a workup's about, a, a workup is a year and a half about. About a year and a half, yeah. So you did a year and a half train up on top of all the training you just did to get out the door. How long do you think it took to gain the respect of your peers um, your 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 new teammates that you're getting ready to go to war with, who they've already been to war. I mean, that's it took a while. You got to man the fuck up and prove yourself to these guys to blend, you know, to to get accepted. It was like showing buds, you know. But I'm show, now I'm showing up to the team as a new guy. Everyone's done what you've done and more. Mm-hmm. Now it's like prove yourself all over again. So it was that whole stress was again happening. And it was just every single day, just putting out, putting out, putting out, make sure I'm right place, right time, right kit. You know, I'm always performing, trying to outdo even the new guys. Yeah. You know, trying to stand out, you know, just prove myself I'm worthy. Uh, and I don't think it was until damn near deployment that we got some, we're pretty much got, got respect, like, hey, okay, full work up. I like how you just said that you showed up and, and, at the same time, you're feeling on top of the world because you just got your trident, you're a SEAL medic, you're checked into SEAL Team 4, 
the fact that you just said everybody's already done what I've done plus more. I mean, that just, just what you've done already by the age 21 is fucking impressive. And to have that attitude going in, I mean, that's kudos to you. Cause yeah. it is, that's very real. Yeah. You show up, you think you're the shit. And then every single person at that team has already done every fucking thing you've done. Exactly. Tenfold. Exactly. And at first, when I first showed up there, yeah, us new guys were like on top of the world. It didn't really hit home until we saw our these seasoned fucking warfighters coming in the doors. Like, okay, yeah, maybe we need to step the fuck back, yeah, humble ourselves a little bit. And it did. We it's not like we we're really arrogant, but we just got to see it and just really like, okay, we know our place. We need to prove ourselves now. Were you glad you were? You knew you were going to combat. Yeah. Right off the bat. Yeah, I was glad. Because that's what we do, that's what we train to do. I mean, I've, I think I'm lucky, and I'm grateful that I had that be able to have that opportunity, even as for my first pump, be able to go to war. I mean, not many seals, even some of the, the older seals that were in my platoon, could even say that. Yeah. So, that was even rare at that time. Yeah. Uh, most guys, my LPO, at the time, did, has never even been in combat. No shit. His whole career, you know. So. Guys going to combat was far from in between. You know, it's kind of luck of the draw. So I was very grateful and lucky to be a part of that platoon. I mean, that was a very interesting time in the teams. I feel like um, post 9-11 up to about that point because there really wasn't a whole hell of a lot going on between Vietnam and 9-11. A couple things here and there. And it created a lot of animosity in the community with the, between the older guys and the newer guys who were coming in and going straight to fucking combat. And other guys, I mean, some guys have retired out of there, you know, and right. never got a chance to do that. But you went right there. Do you feel like you were ready? I feel like after work up, everything up to that point, I was. Definitely my mind was right. I wanted to go. I felt confident. Uh, I felt comfortable with being a part of the platoon. Um, it felt solid. Uh, at first, I thought I was going to Iraq and was all geared up for that, and then I s ended up switching troops. Okay. I needed a medic and I ended up going to Afghanistan. You switched troops or switched platoons. They needed a medic, which means you're the fucking primary medic as a new guy going to Afghanistan. Correct? Yeah. That's a shit ton of of responsibility. How do you think you handled that? I felt I handled it pretty good. I mean, I was mentored up by solid individuals in my tri my original platoon. Uh, solid medics, senior medics, and older guys, because there's only like five of us new guys. The majority of the platoon was all senior guys. I had, you know, multiple combat, or if not just one. So seasoned, and they, they brought us up right, and definitely, gave me the the confidence to fucking succeed and do my job well and that's how I felt I mean I was more I was actually a little bummed and torn that I had to leave my platoon but then I, at the same time I was like really excited to go to Afghanistan because that was a spot what uh, at what point in the train in the workup did you switch platoons at the very end I was in uh, I was done with workup so you just spent a year and a half proving yourself to a new team, only to get removed, put in another new team, where you have to prove yourself as a new guy again, and you're the fucking primary medic. I mean. Yeah, me and two other guys. Those are some big shoes to fill. It was, it was intimidating because I didn't know anybody besides there's two other guys that came with me, the snipers. Um, one was a sniper. So they kind of were a buffer, a little conduit. They but, were a little more protective yeah, of their new guy. Yeah, because I was their new guy. <laughs> uh, I knew some of the new guys they had, but yeah, same thing. I had to prove myself because they didn't know who I was. They had some, my other guys kind of vouching for me, but same token, it's, I still got to prove myself. How do you think your dad felt when he found out, I mean, he gave you the pamphlet to become a SEAL. You become a SEAL. Now you're getting ready to go out the door and do this shit for real.
Yeah, I don't. It's honestly hard to say because I never asked him how he really truly felt, but I'm sure he was nervous because I did tell him up front. I, I thought about just like lying and just bullshitting my parents and telling them where I was just going to make up, some, just say I was going to Europe or something just to be, be fine, I'll be good, and I'll be able to call you whenever. That crossed my mind, uh, but at the end of the day, I was like, no, I'm just going to tell them where I'm actually going because this is what I signed up to do. Mm -hmm. I felt it was right. I mean, what do you expect? We're Navy SEALs. This is what we do. Yeah. Um, we go to war and, and handle it. But I'm sure he was nervous. And he was excited because I actually doing what I wanted to do, what I love to do. But I'm also certain that he was probably scared shitless. I know my mom was. Yeah. <laughs> Did you try to shelter him from what was actually happening? Yeah. I never, I, I kept it vague. Yeah. I, never, I didn't go to nitty gritty. And I kept it very vague. I said I was going to Afghanistan. That was it. I didn't say like where, you know, obviously I didn't tell them really what I was doing. Even when I was there and I reached, I called them, emailed them, or even I tried to call them once in a while on a sat phone, we got to call them. I just didn't even talk about what the hell I was doing. It's more of this, you know, how's yeah. it going? I'm good. You hear my voice, like I'm doing well type of conversation. Yeah. Um, it's funny, you lose almost all emotional communication yeah somewhere along that pipeline it seems like almost all guys do there's no more sense of emotion yeah you put up a shield like not really realizing it it just happens yeah innately because it's work you know you got it it's all business you know you can't bring motion into it and you can't and i, I didn't want to do that to my family like they're going to be worried sick yeah. Like putting undue stress on themselves because I'm over there. You know, I didn't want that to happen. So I'm sure it still did anyway, but I didn't want to feel that far. You're getting ready to leave for combat as a brand new medic to Afghanistan with your new platoon as a new guy. Going back to your dad, who you're extremely extremely close with. Do you think his uh, do you think his mindset changed at all? Did he get worried that you were now that it became very real, like, hey dad, I'm going to Afghanistan for six to nine months. I would say so, yeah. I mean, at the time he didn't they didn't really express their worries to me that much because they wanted me to remain focused. But I knew, because after the fact I, I spoke to them, but I knew they were, the stress was high. They were definitely were worried. Um, i say more fear of the unknown, for them at least, because uh, I was the first one in the immediate family going in the military, and they had no experience of anyone in their family going in the military. So this is all new to everybody. So out in your family, you're the first one yeah. that's, that's going in the military, and you're going to war at the highest level. Exactly. And they, so they knew I, I want to be doing some things. I want to take a call. And um, I have your dad on the line, Jim. Hey, Jim, how's it going? This is Sean Ryan. Hey, hey Sean. <laughs> I've got your son sitting here. And we're talking about right before he leaves on his first combat deployment at SEAL Team 4 as a new guy. And yep. I was wondering if you have any questions you'd like to ask him. <laughs> hey, Travis. Hey, Dad. I do, actually. I, I, I remember the day he called me to kind of say goodbye to me when he was getting ready to head out for that, for that deployment. I wonder just how he felt when he landed in Afghanistan after all the years of training for that and everything that led up to that moment. I know it was a big deal for him. He's been thinking about it ever since high school. And I was just always curious how he really felt when he actually landed in Afghanistan with his team for that first deployment. How I felt about it. Yep. I mean, I was scared. I, mean, I was talking to Sean about this. I was definitely nervous as hell. I think those nerves turned into more it, with the excitement and the motivation, but definitely scared as shit because I knew I knew exactly I was doing it for real. I mean, I, I wasn't going to Europe or South America. I was actually going to war. All that training and hard work coming to fruition finally. It was, I couldn't even figure, I could, it's hard for me to even explain in words to 
obviously you guys what I was going to be doing, but I kind of just in the back of my mind hoped that you understood or at least somewhat understood what I was actually going to do. No, I for sure did. Yeah, it was emotional day for me when you said goodbye, but. Jim, I got a question for you. Um, so you were really supportive of Travis going into the into the SEAL teams and, and uh, doing that job. How did it feel for you when he checked into SEAL Team 4 and you realized, holy shit, my son's going straight to, straight to combat after we've already been at war for seven years? Yeah, that was definitely an emotional day for me. I didn't like, I still remember that call clearly. I, I didn't want to let on to him how emotional it was for me, actually, but it was a big deal. But I know he was so driven. He, that's all he ever thought about and worked hard towards, so I was just so proud of him. But at the same time, you know, I was definitely nervous, too, you know, knowing he was going to Afghanistan. I never knew, never, didn't really know how, what would happen. Actually, didn't know when I'd actually talk to the gang, because I knew he'd be going on missions, and he said he would check in when he could. I just never knew when that would be, so it was definitely a real emotional day for me with that last call. How was that? How was that six-month deployment for you as a father? Was that compared to all the other time in your life? Was that? Would you say that was probably one of the most stressful moments of your entire life? Yes, it was a stressful six months, especially the first like two or three months. I heard, heard from him very seldom, and pretty much every day you're thinking about your son being over there and having no idea what you're up to. So, as a parent, it's tough. Yeah. So, That's a difficult dynamic. It's definitely emotional. Dynamic. I can emotional now even talk about it. It's crazy. It's been years now. It's not like crazy to think about it. But it was a big deal. You got anything I'm for... I'm blown away. You got anything <laughs> for your dad? No. I mean, I'm glad that you... I guess after you saying that, you had a good mindset about it. Because at the time, I was given vague information. Because I didn't know either. I mean, I didn't know when the hell I was about to even call or what type of connectivity I was going to have there, et cetera. Or I kind of had an idea. I knew what we were doing, but I didn't know the how you know important or much we were going to be doing. Uh, so it was even hard and difficult to me to explain to my family what exactly what I was getting into. And I purposely didn't. I purposely didn't I kept it vague. I, did, I said, hey, this is where I'm going. I actually almost thought about lying and be like, I'm going somewhere else. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to go to Europe. I'm going to Europe for six months. I'll, build it. I'll call you when I get there or something. Just keep it really vague and keep it comfortable. But at the end of the day, I, I felt like I would be doing a disservice. I'd be like, no, this is where I'm going. Yeah. So this is this is what I do. We were always, we were always proud of him. He definitely worked his ass off to get there. And, you know, even through high school, he was driven to be a SEAL. He got in the buzz. He used to call me and tell me, Dad, I'm never going to quit. They're never going to break me. Driven young man, and you know, he couldn't be more proud of him. Jim, I got one last question for you before we jump off the line here. Yep. What made you hand Travis the brochure on being a Navy SEAL? I just. You remember that? The way Travis would always talk, he'd always just talk. He just wanted to, you know, to be something special, make a difference in the world. And just, I just felt the drive in him, and I felt like just. The drive it would take to actually become a SEAL would, you know, could test him to push him to through all the limits he could be pushed through. So I, I just knew that was up his alley. Just the way he would talk about what he wanted to do in life. I've just never seen a person more driven at such a young age. And I thought, well, I, I think this could be perfect for him with the drive that he has. This is exactly what I think might be his calling. Wow, that's a. So you knew he was going to make it right off the bat. I did. It just was amazing. I mean, literally. It's, I, I don't want to go into too much of it, but even through high school, he's out. His buddies would be out to parties the weekends. He'd begin up early doing ocean swims, beach runs. I mean, he was doing buds training while he was in high school. <laughs> I mean, he wanted to be a scuba diver when he was 16. I said, all right, let's do it. You know, he, wanted to, he was like training for buds all through high school. And I just saw the drive in him. That's why I said, you know, this is, this is his calling. I just saw it. Where do you think he got his drive from? I just think, I mean, I guess maybe as a young dad, maybe he saw how I always just was pushing and pushing and pushing to make sure we made it in life together. Because I, ha I was 20 years old when he was born. So, but, you know, just, he just saw the drive and need to be a good father to him. And I think that just kind of carried over into his life. That's
That's incredible. Definitely. And businessman. Having him running his own business. Yeah. And so definitely. Well, Jim, I really appreciate your time and, and for the call and and uh we'll be home soon. <laughs> well, I appreciate checking in. Have fun, Josh. All right, Dad, thanks. All right. Bye bye. See you guys. Bye. How did that feel? That was a pleasant surprise. And very <laughs> unexpected. Was it? Did you know all that stuff before or how he felt and um no. Because I, I honestly I never really asked. Yeah. So, but I knew they probably did feel that way, like I said, but I just, I mean, even to this day, I haven't asked him. Yeah. I don't know. But it's good. I mean, he had the right mindset. Well, you guys are obviously very close, and that's really cool to see. But enough of the mushy stuff. <laughs> Let's move on to combat. So your boots on the ground, Afghanistan, what year? 2010. 2010. A lot of shit happened right around then. Like, Bin Laden got killed. Yep. Where'd you land? Did you land in Bagram? I landed in uh, Kaf, Kandahar. No shit. You went straight to Kandahar. Yeah. Went to Kandahar, and then from there, we sh loaded up and shipped out to a place called Fob Lane. At the time, still Team 3 was there. Um, it's a little little tiny fob, and back in the day, it was owned by an SF unit. Then uh, team guys took it over. It was in southeast Afghanistan, uh, a province called Zabul, in the area called Argandab. So it was definitely a hot spot of the, of the time in the area. But we ended up getting arriving there, and then Seal Team Three was there, like I said. And we ended up doing, you know, once we hit boots on the ground, dude, dudes were fired up motivated to get checked in we kind of qu pretty quickly I'd say within the first week we started planning in, in for our first turnover up so fairly fast just for reference southern Afghanistan down in Kandahar is uh, one of the hottest zones and always has been um, throughout the what almost two decades of combat yeah. going on or wartime in Afghanistan and how long were you there before, how long, I mean, did you guys even have time to settle in? Because I in Kef. did a lot of research and I talked to some of your friends and I mean, you guys were getting it. So in, once we arrived to our FOB. Yeah. Yeah. It, like I said, it was pretty quick. Uh, we got half, I would say half SEAL Team 3 platoon kind of left as we arrived. Mm -hmm. And then the, the kind of leadership, more senior guys stayed on board to do turnover with us. Uh, but it was fairly quickly before we started turning and burning and have that nice, that good battle rhythm, and just started going. Because our, 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 honestly, the le leadership that I had was eager and hungry. What backtrack real quick before we get into th the details? What were your living conditions like? How many people? A lot of people don't understand what a fob is. A fob is not like a big base. It's a small, fortified. A lot of times you're using sandbags as um, cover. Can you kind of describe your living conditions? How many guys you were with? Were there locals? We had, so we had our entire platoon. So about, we actually went there with, I would say 18 SEALs, 18, I think it was 19, 18 or 19 SEALs. And we had another handful of enablers plus SEAL Team 3 there. So we had almost 60 guys, I would say on this FOB. We only had, one, we had no locals that slept on our fob with us. None? None, or partner force. Okay. So they had their own, own little fob. I was sleeping and we had like little bee huts, little wooden rooms. So this fob, honestly, was pretty well, it was decently built up because it's been, it had been there for a while. Like I said, the Army SF unit, ODA unit ran it and established this thing. So it, it pretty well built up. Um, it wasn't very big, but it was decently built up. Uh, so living conditions, honestly, my first appointment weren't bad. So I was, we were all pretty, com decently comfortable. Um, okay. As far as sleeping is concerned, but we, we would get attacked on a nightly basis. So that comfort wasn't, went out the window. Every night you're getting attacked. Pretty much, yeah. What are you getting attacked with? Small, Small arms, arms, indirect. Okay. Yeah, indirect any, fire. Any close calls? A few, 
some would in, get into the base, but not near the, where we slept. Um, but it was mainly just kind of sporadic fire. They were definitely aiming at us and getting close, but nothing, I wouldn't say, effective, at least on our FOB. Well, um, were you having to defend the base at all, or was it all pretty much in? No, we got, we every time we base defense, we had a good, we used our RGs, we had some RG31s with uh, the 50 cals on it, and we also had a... Which is? The up armored um, all terrain vehicle. Okay. So it's a big beefed up looking all terrain. And we had a 50 cal, they have 50 cal weapon system, a remote weapon system, they call them RWSs on top of those things. So we, we placed those in position. We also had a huge tower with the 50 on it uh, that we would use as well. And then we also had a mortar pit too. Okay. So we would send our own indirect fire. What point, um, so how long were you there before you started leaving the wire? And going out on on your own ops and what what was your mission there so our mission was a uh, strike force we ended up just doing the straight um, village clearance and direct action um, but our very first op that some, we did uh, turn our turnover op was one that was pretty impactful uh, for everybody that was there uh, we did a turnover op with SEAL team three only few, very few guys in my platoon actually went, went on it because it was mostly SEAL Team Three doing a turnover, um, just kind of see how they did business, um, kind of SOPs, and they left late that night, and before you know, the sun even rose, we I got woken up in the middle of the night, loaded the helo because the helo crashed. Oh shit! Killed everybody. So we lost Team Four. Four guys, three guys, all the crew, the whole crew, everybody in the bird uh, went down. We lost a, one guy survived. Andrew Dow, he survived. Fuck man, miracle. But so the bird ended up crashing on the hillside, going down. It didn't it didn't get shot down or anything, but it was going because we did a lot of Overwatch positions. We call them SE positions. And then we had the main element down on the ground during the village, and we had the overwatch positions, which we call supporting element, up in the mountains. So we did a lot of that at night. So the helos would land at these peaks, and sometimes they wouldn't even touch ground. They would just hover over because the, they couldn't land on these mountain tops because they're so the terrain was rugged. Yeah. So this bird ended up just clipping the side of the mountain and lost everybody except one. So. So that, I got woken up in that, loaded the bird, went over to hover over it because there was nobody there. There was only, because the other bird was getting dropped off somewhere else on another peak. So I got woken up, loaded the bird, grabbed all my med kit. I mean, that was like something, I, hey, hello, like fucking reality check. Bird just went down. Let's expect everyone to be dead. Um, Jesus. Get your fucking med kit, get your litters now. Fucking grabbed all my shit. I had it all staged, thank God, all ready to fucking go, but I'd load up as quickly as I can, jumped in the bird, and then we took off. By the time we got there, we hovered over it. By the time we got there, the PJs were there. Um, they started the recovery. So that was our very first op as a platoon. Jesus Christ. Lost dudes right off the bat. That's, um, that's fucking tough. Yeah, that was a definitely huge kind of wake up call for the boys. Yeah. And that was tough too. That was because we we haven't like I said up to that point we haven't done anything. Yeah. We didn't even go on an op. We're still fucking trying to get our feet wet, figure shit out. And next thing you know, we lose fucking five guys. So it's 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 real fucking real. Yeah, that's real. real. This fucking this this is reality now. So it was definitely that put a, a damper on things. I, I wouldn't say, not for a long time, actually, believe it or not. Probably, I would say, for a few days. Yeah. It was tough. Um, but the turnaround, we had really good leadership that they understood that it was important to fucking keep the guys moving. Yeah. Keep the mind focused. A lot of times when you lose guys in a combat zone, and you know them, it'll create a type of 
uh, ritual, or maybe not a ritual, but um, something that you'll do to prepare yourself before every like a mission. Superstition. Yeah. Did you? Like a, did, yeah, that's, I would say like a ritual. Did I do anything? Yeah. Did that specific incident because it happened so fast once you got in country. Did that? Did that create any kind of uh, routine before you would go on on a mission, like some kind of superstition, or? I didn't develop, we all, as a platoon, we all like took a knee and prayed before we went out. Um, that was kind of a mutual agreement and I've never done anything like that at that point, but I, I did it with them just just to fucking keep the mind right yeah. every time we stepped out the door and I, I, I think it helped yeah. to stay focused. Um, but after that event, you know, that, the boys were, everyone was locked tight because they knew that, I mean, that doesn't get more real than that. No. You know, most guys go to combat, you know, they may not experience it, you know, some, a lot do, but you going in expecting not to experience it. You don't want your boys to fucking die. Yeah. You don't want you to lose teammates. Yeah, that's the, the worst possible scenario, but you still, you, you hope for the best. You don't want that shit happening to your own, your own teammates. But I think after that event, Everybody just fucking locked the fuck on. I mean, yeah. everyone was already locked on, but that just a whole nother level. So that over the top. Yeah. Now you're chomping at the bit. Yeah. Now that motion's a little angry. Yeah. You know, we're in bad guy country. So now, like, the motivation's even more to fucking just get after and take it to them. Yeah. A lot of, um, myself included, use tragic events or the loss of friends to kind of build that anger and fuel um, your mindset uh, before going on ops, which is, and that's why I asked that question. Yeah. What was your guys' op tempo like? A few times a week. I would say three to four times a week we'd be out the door. We'd, we All we did was fly away ops, leave in the middle of the night, heat lows, go into villages. Um, Majority of them were 24 hours to 48 hours. We, we did longer ones, 72. So we didn't do, the only time we did local, we would just walk to our little local village or something like that. But 95% of them were all flyaways, like I said, three, four times a week, um, village clearance. Were you guys looking for something specific? Were you stirring up the hornet's nest? What was the... We would be a, talk about a, little bit, a little bit of both targeting, a lot of a presence, and establishing more of a green zone for us, and just showing face. We would clear the village, but at the end of the day, the mission was, hey, clear the village, let's get the elders together, let's establish rapport and build relationships. Um, but we're all, at the same time, we're filtering out the bad guys. That's kind of the underarching, is, but the overarching mission was, hey, we need to build, make sure to increase our green zone, build relations, um, and show more presence. But that was our main focus, and I spent the majority of that deployment, if not all that deployment, on top of mountains. Yeah. <laughs> Were you guys getting after it? Were you engaging? Yeah. Every time you left the wire, was uh, it hit or miss? I wouldn't say, not every time. Okay. Uh, Definitely a hit or miss. It would, I'd say about 50% of the time we were getting um, ticks. Okay. We are getting in contact with the enemy. And you're doing flyaways, so you're getting in a tick on foot. You on don't foot. have any, you guys aren't bringing any vehicles, maybe some nope, dirt all bikes, on nothing. On all foot. On we foot. get small arms and indirect. And how many guys are going on ops with you, roughly? The entire platoon, so we're almost 30 guys with enablers okay. and partner force. So we'd roll out the door with partner force as well. And platoon, you know, that's 18 guys, 19 guys, plus our enablers, another five. So we're up there. We had a decent force. But we ended up having two supporting elements with at least four guys. And then the main element was the big element in the ground, which was doing the clearance. We had two overwatch positions, so. And where were you? I would end up always being on the overwatch. Okay. A few times I'd go down there on the main element uh but more often than not i would just 
volunteered to go on the overwatch position yeah. and they would put me on there my leadership would put me up there too uh, so i got very familiar with the mountains of afghanistan yeah were you watching your guys get into engagements yeah but actually more often than that we would get in the ticks okay they would see us up there because these this is where these dudes are hanging out yeah they're not hanging out on the ground we so, talking night we talking day, day. we would go in at night insert at night and then execute during the day just at sunrise okay so the helos when you guys would take off for an op they weren't you weren't landing right in the village you would land we would offset from the village the main element not far maybe like a click okay and then uh they would patrol in and then right at first light they would you know break that last line of cover and start make, start conducting clearance and then we would they would insert us at some peak we would do some false inserts and then insert us at a certain peak and then we'd control up to the top of the mountain where we needed to go but believe it or not i've been in a lot of times where we ended up being very close to where the enemy's hanging out yeah these guys are on the ground they don't they didn't from my first deployment my experience then they didn't have the balls to go face to face on the ground with with uh, seals with us at least they would occasionally but it would be more sporadic and they would be at a distance it wouldn't be super effective i would be i got more effective fire when i was up in the supporting element than i ever did when i was on the ground no shit oh. that's interesting um did you utilize your your training as an 18 delta on that deployment i did only medical treatment i didn't after that deployment, we didn't get any Nothing no serious injuries. Yeah, I did uh, local minimal stuff for partner force. We ended up doing med caps every weekend for the villagers. So I would do a lot of treatment for that. Okay. Um, but as far as combat care, no, because we didn't have any serious injuries post the helo crash. Yeah. So let's wrap that deployment up. You coming home as a new guy? Or I guess you're not a new guy anymore, but I mean, shit, that's, I mean, that's pretty fucking real uh, right off the bat to um, cut your teeth into. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you coming back, going back to the team and seeing the next batch of new guys enter into your platoon? Um, and you're going straight back to combat again mm -hmm. for the next one. Yeah, I was going right back into one troop again. Uh, staying there and I knew damn near right away we knew we were going to go to Afghanistan because Iraq kind of stopped mm -hmm. and now they had they needed to actually at the time all the troops were going to Afghanistan this next go around it was that much in demand so all of them were going so everyone we, yeah the south even the three troops south competition some of the guys were even go, getting filtered out and going too so that's how much the demand was so we I knew it was going Coming back home from deployment, you know, was, I don't even know how to describe it, but it was, if, I was relieved, I was kind of ready to come home at that point. Um, nervous too, because I've been gone kind of for so long, it seemed like. Yeah. Uh, being my first deployment, so I really didn't know how to act or yeah. even behave once I got back. Um, I mean, I wasn't married or had kids or anything, so I came back and it was just, me so I just pretty much just continue doing work again yeah I mean I did go home like a month later took some leave took like two weeks came back here to California hung out with the family was it hard but to, I mean uh, interact a little bit because I felt like they wanted to ask stuff mm -hmm. and they didn't they didn't know how to ask it and they didn't ask it and they really didn't know how to like because I know I noticed this now more than in the past when I was a new guy. Like, as soon as you're around people that are very unfamiliar with military in general, let alone SEALs and like deployment, they just they think the things that you've done may have messed you up or something, or may have they put this stigma on you. Um, maybe no fault to their own because that's just like kind of the mentality. But I felt that way. Like, you all right? You know, you, everything good, you know, how's, how was deployment, you know, you doing good, et cetera. But I, over time, it was fine. Like, I kind of just 
got back on on the grind of being on the back of the team again. Um, and it was a good. It was actually a good feeling once I kind of platooned up again, and now yeah. was an older guy, if you want to say that. Uh, and then now I got to work with my new, you know, mentor new guys, and you know, watch them prove themselves to me and the rest of the fucking guys that you know been there and done that. Yeah. As well. Did you find out you're going back to Afghanistan how fast after you got back from your first pump in Afghanistan? I would say we found out officially probably halfway through, but I, at the beginning we always knew that we were going to go back. So maybe a good maybe a good 6 months yeah. where you were kind of like iffy and then 6 months later so you, you have six a 6 months later it's like deployment. hey no you're no shit going to Afghanistan. Now it's where where are we going in Afghanistan? Is the oh, thing. okay. So you did know the you knew like right away. Yeah. So it's like okay, we knew because I, I, like I said, everyone was gonna go there, but it was more of the question of where exactly in Afghanistan are we going? Because yeah. the other troops ended up going like CAF, mm. major bases. Yeah. So this was kind of again ends up with that competition. We need to be the best performing fucking platoon to get the best mission because at the time VSO was coming about, Village Stability Ops what we called it um and that was the mission the mindset of we need to win the hearts and minds kind of win over the people and that was the mission to be on because that was we were getting you wanted to be sent in the most remote areas yeah the more chance to get you wanted take, to be we wanted there. that yeah more chance to get into firefights get after it less stress of the flagpole you know we're on our own you know, we're do we could do our own thing and be effective. You know, we're not we don't have our hands tied if we're like the units at CAF. When we, we're all like that's like major hub, um, which the other two troops ended up going. So we ended up getting the VSO mission at the end of the day. At the end of the workup, we had a solid head shed, a lot of experience, dev group guys, and they really groomed the troop well. And we had strong chiefs and, you know, all that leadership was, was really tight. So your immediate reaction when you found out you're going right back to Afghanistan in a year, year and a half, depending on how long your workup is, were you, did you want to go back? Were you excited to go back? Did that become home for you? I was excited to go back. You were? Yeah. I was hungry to go back again. Uh, I was, especially after my first experience, I felt I was way more experienced and more prepared. And I knew what I was getting myself into. So I was ready to go back. Um, and at, the, at that time, they're like, hey, guess what? We're, you're also going to be staying eight months. Maybe you could be up to 10 months. 10 months. Yeah. So it was like eight to 10. Because before that, still Team 10 went out there and they ended up staying there for 10 months. Yeah. Right before us. So that was a, a change as well because with this new mi new VSO mission, they required us to be on the ground longer okay. to build relationships. That was kind of the mindset, the strategy behind it. So we knew we were going to be there longer. Okay. So it was going to be rougher. And being that VSO mission, we knew we were going to be – this this deployment was going to be rough. It was, too. It was unlike – nothing like my first one. The second one was worse. Second one was, yeah. Were you and Jeff together on? This one we were together. Okay. Did you guys know each other before then? Yeah, we did a little bit, but we were in different troops. Where do you fly into for your second deployment? Let's skip the work up and let's just go straight back over there. What, where did you fly into this time? Same place, CAF. Right yep. back to an outer base? Right back to CAF. And then we had to fly to, I ended up going to the same area, southeast Afghanistan. Again, Argandab. River Valley, where my first deployment was, but I was just a little further north um, of where I, my first FOB was, because that FOB ended up going away. So we established SEAL Team 2 was here. They established this VSO site. When we got there, it was nothing. It was like three, two tents, Alaskan tents, a couple HESCOs. I mean, this thing wasn't even a, a base. It wasn't even fully. So it had a little, I could throw a football to one end. It was less than 100 yards. No shit. Yeah, it was small so you're this base is less than a football field yeah and uh, like smaller than a football smaller field than a size, football field with two tents yeah when we got there it was two tents 
What and the we hell had, they didn't have no, no running water, no shitters. They were right next to a village, and then their partner for us owned a compound that they took over right next to the, the team guy's little site. And these guys were rough. I mean, when we got there, we were like, holy shit. You know, like these guys were fucking roughing it. Yeah. And this was like real deal. Uh, so that was unexpected. We got, we had a little kind of, they told us a little bit, but we had no idea it was like, like that magnitude, that level. You know, but yeah, these guys were roughing it. They didn't have anything because you couldn't drive there. No, no, helos would hardly ever come because every time they would come in here, they would get shot at every single time. So, the you know, upper level was like, no, we can't bring any helos in there. So it was like very rare that they would even, for us even getting there was a pain. Yeah. Even sh to change out crews it was a pain in the ass. But Just, um, can you walk us through a little bit more about how many people were on this fob? With, was it just your troop? Were you it was, no, it was just the platoon. Okay, so there's like 16 guys. Yeah, with enablers by pushing 20, a little over t like 21, 22 with enablers. And then we, SEAL Team 2 was there, a platoon. Um, they had minimal guys when we showed up because they already shipped some guys off. So I think they had like 12 guys. Um, so it was tight. We were sleeping on top of each other. We ended up making another tent so we could all pack in. We're sleeping on cots, literally right next to each other, just racked up, jam as many as we can in there um, until we got more more gear, more equipment, because we, we didn't even have any more tents. There was nowhere to sleep. Shit. We had to sleep on top of each other um, until SEAL Team 2 finally get out of there. But we did a couple turnover ops, which ended up going pretty smooth. Mm -hmm. um, so that went well, and then they ended up leaving. And then from there, the whole time was like literally build up shop. We needed to establish some sort of living, but we literally the whole time I was there, we had no running water. Uh, we always slept on cots. We didn't have a kitchen. It was in like a dirt hut. They would drop us food via airdrop because uh, no helos would come in hardly ever. Were you living with locals? Yeah, we lived, we had locals, live, a partner for us living on our fob. How many? There was about six of them. What was that relationship like? Did you guys have any confidence in them? Some, a lot of units have different uh, I had confidence, so I ran actually these guys. I, the role I was in, I ended up being like their handler, paying them, make sure they had their gear. You know, those guys actually were good. They were our counter IED kind of partner for us. They were solid. Um, so we didn't really mind. Um, they're trustworthy. We felt comfortable with them walking around on our fob and they had weapons. Um, the partner for us, our real partner for us, the ANASF guys are with us that lived in the compound probably like 50 yards away. Um, we're decent at first and like towards the middle of the point we had some hiccups, we had to get rid of them because we, we lost confidence. Oh. That, because they were, we, I think we, we ended up doing something that they didn't like and then mm. we had to call in counterintelligence guys to interview them and there was some uh, w red flags with uh, kind of attitudes towards us, maybe possible fucking signs of attack yeah. or aggression. This happens a lot yeah. with a lot of different units and a lot of different agencies. When you guys got rid of them, where did they go? Did you guys just cut them loose and send them back to their town? Because that can create an entire new enemy No, uh, towards you. The ANASF was kind of somewhat of an established force, somewhat. Um, so, but they just we got them heat. They got out of there. So we they didn't we didn't say hey walk away from the fob and just go find your own path. They got in a bird, and we shipped them out of there. Got a whole another unit. Okay. So it was it was fairly easy, but at up to that point till they left, it was like we didn't trust them. Like hey don't you can't come over here with you can't even approach our our fob our little VSO site with a gun. Yeah. Like, do not. You can come over here, no weapons though. We searched them, just a lot of animosity was building up. So you're dealing with that, and then you said it was hotter your second deployment. Yeah. So were you guys getting hit on the fob too? Oh yeah. All I the mean, time? Once we got there, I mean, it was damn near every night. 
every night. We would call it Tick 30. Fucking every night, right when sundown, these dudes would just smash us with small arms, and they would it would be effective and indirect. It would land, it'd be in our coming through our tents, small arm with PCAM rounds, and then indirect fire as well. Uh, landing in our fob and just right out of it, fucking one fucking blew up our kitchen, damn near killed a dude. He was in there, lucky he dove into our little, our little med center was attached to our kitchen, so he ended up luckily diving into that. Uh, got some frag in his back, but he uh, came out unscathed. But but they were, that happened on a nightly basis. I mean, at first, dudes were not expecting that. I mean, tensions were high. We were like, at night, going to bed, you know, we're relaxed. Um, our shit's ready to go, but you know, we didn't. We weren't expecting that. Uh, it, it took some time to fucking get used to, and then before you know it, dudes were in their racks with like full cami, full kit, just ready to go because we knew it was coming. Yeah. Just every night would just be the same fucking thing. Shit, man. So what? I mean, what was your, what was your op tempo like this deployment compared to? More. We were going on a daily basis on this one. Daily, but every day you're going out, and. Are we doing foot patrols? Or we're doing foot, yeah, we're doing foot patrols to local villages, maybe further north, a little bit south. Presence increase again, increasing that green zone because we only go so far because we we didn't do any type of flyaways. It was all because VSO we needed to stay local. Did a lot of ones in the the village near us, but every time it seemed like every time we went out, we were getting new tick. Wow! Every single time. So you're going out every day, you get in a gunfight outside of your fob, then you come home, or maybe maybe this had already happened, but and then you got to deal with the base getting hit. So I mean that's yeah, it, it honestly was like that. I would say all the way up till December, it kind of died down a little bit because it got cold. Um, so we were kind of expecting that. But it's even still, like, they still would fucking, we, every time we would, the base attacks would lighten up, but every time we went out the door, those would be the same. Wow. Uh, they just they knew what, where the fuck we were going. They could see us before we were coming. That was just hard for us because we were just, we didn't do any night ops. It was all bright, middle of the day. They knew we were going there to fucking meet, just meet key leaders. Um shake hands and establish rapport and just hold up security. We weren't necessarily t targeting individuals. We did it a few times. Um, we ended up, I ran Intel, so we ended up going on missions purely driven off the Intel that was found via myself, sources, and my other teammate that was, we were partners together in it. So we would gather our own Intel and then target that way. Wow. And then other missions we would get from higher as well, but and we got creative with it. That deployment we said was roughly ten months, nine to ten months. It was about yeah, almost. It was about eight. How many engagements would you say you and or your team were part of in that eight months? Do you have any idea? I don't. I mean, it's I I, it's, I lost count. It was that many. I mean, I I don't know a hard number. Yeah. It was a lot, I would say, pushing 100. Yeah, I mean. With all the ops, fob attacks, and even just go going out the door, like, damn near right around the corner, next village up, or even our own village. I mean, just a six-month deployment alone is 180 days. And if you guys were taking, if you guys were taking fire and getting into ticks almost every day, and you did longer than six months, just to put that in perspective for you, because most guys don't think about this. That's 180 fucking engagements. Yeah, I that's think a it, lot of engagements. At the time, I didn't even look at it like that because you just you don't pay attention to it. Yeah. You know, you just you're ready for the next. Yeah, one. ready for the next one, and then before you know it, you know, I, I think they the leadership did keep track of it, um, but guys didn't really focus on it. But it was it was a lot. I mean, it felt like like you said, it felt like every damn night. And it almost it, it, the beginning, it was. They wanted to fucking try something. You've never thought about that until just now. So, what's that sound like to you when I put that in perspective and I say, you took part in over 180 fucking engagements in less than eight in in eight months. Oh, a disbelief. 
Yeah, that's a lot of fucking yeah. combat. I've never really thought of it like that. You know, at the because at the time you're just doing the job, you're doing your job, and you're not thinking of it as a tick, like a like a check in the box, like oh, I got one, two, three. So how many ticks I got? Yeah. You know. What range are you guys fighting at? Is it always different? Is it up close and personal, or is it? Are they throughout a that deployment? Meters away? It was everything. Everything and in, in between. Do you guys have air support? We had some air support occasionally, with uh, little birds. And we had, sometimes we had some uh, F-18s, fast movers, we would come in. Nice. Uh, but mainly just the helo support. I would only, that was like the only platform that would really be available even to come in to help us out. So, but not often, not every time. Because you're really out there hanging out there. Yeah, it was just us. Yeah. It was really just us. We had some Army guys attached to us, a little Army unit that we utilized for FOB security. Um, and some other support. So it was really just us doing our thing out there. Uh, it was a bl you know blessing in disguise, I think. I mean, it was we got so much out of it, and I don't think we would have the experience we had if we were were anything else. I wouldn't have that deployment if I would say went to CAF or anything like that. I mean, r really, truly, it was just us. That was our deployment. We were fully control over it, and definitely learned a lot. And had a shit ton of experiences. I mean, for God's sake, Hilo, we had another Hilo crash at this FOB. Thank God it wasn't as horrific as the first one I experienced. Hilo coming in at 47, came in, crashed on our FOB. Shit. Came in nose down because our, our uh, HLZ was kind of a slope. Came in nose down, dusted himself out, slow rolled into the corner of our our uh, HESCO barriers, which HESCO barriers are filled with dirt on the border of the, the site, hit that, completely destroyed that 47, split the front end in half, destroyed every blade. There was a Mark 19 in that corner, so grenades are going off. Shit. Like, it sounded like we just, like, everyone was inside at this time. It was midday, only like, two people were out there. You thought you were getting hit. Oh, yeah. I could like, run out there. Oh, I was, like, in my tent. I remember and I heard this huge explosion, grabbed my med bag, fucking ran out there, looked, and I see a 47 just blowing up. I mean, this thing was shreds. Believe it or not, the two, the, the crew survived. I was like, that holy, fucking it was fucking amazing. amazing. Yeah. These guys were crushed up into the, the front end. The, the two uh, side door gunners were smashed up into it into because the, the whole front end nose crunched. And these dudes, they were they were beat, beat to shit, but they survived. Shit. Yeah, it was it was unbelievable. Did you guys lose anybody on that deployment? Only per, we didn't know. No team guys, no American forces. We lost our uh, one of our close partner forces, the, the one of the guys that lived on the base with us. Our counter IED guys, their head dude, their leader, was uh, shot in the head, killed during an op, during a tick lucky shot I mean it was it was actually kind of it was a hard loss even for us because he he we became close with him because there was only six of them and these guys were northern Afghanis mm -hmm. and these dudes fucking hate Taliban yeah the Pashtun people that live in the south so these dudes were really truly there for the right cause right reason fighting for their country and they're fucking good at what they did to fucking be honest. motivated yeah huh? they're fucking it was good to see that and motivated us yeah if we could just work with them, we were like, we're just taking you guys. Fuck everyone, everyone else. That's one thing I've noticed about the Afghans um, versus my ex personal experience with the Iraqis is the Iraqis, most of when we had those guys attached to us, most of them were fucking lazy and they didn't really want to be there. But uh, on the other hand, the Afghans, I mean, those are some fucking dedicated fighters. Yeah. And uh, they want to make shit happen and they want to fucking be there. And um, which is really cool to see, you know, that to see uh, a host nation, you know, wanting to, you know, do the right thing. But yeah, it was it was humbling to, to see that shit because it makes you do want to do your job harder. Like, cause yeah. you're there helping them out, fighting for their country and your country. And you see that it's, it's good. Shit. It was hard for their team the loss. They actually quit. They all left. 
because they didn't want to work anymore because they lost their commander. But eventually talked them back into coming back to us. Yeah. So it was a difficult time. But overall, um, experience for the books, man. Yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah. I'm going to take another call. We got a mutual friend on the line who was there that whole second deployment with you, Jeff Reed. About time. <laughs> Jeff Reed from Frozen Trident. How the hell are you? Dude, I am doing great. How are you doing? Pretty good, man. So, uh, I got a buddy of yours that I think you might know on, on uh, my show right now, Travis Kennedy. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Good to hear your voice, man. Good to hear you, bro. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm glad you got to call in. So I got a question for you guys. There's a, I was scouring through both your uh, Instagrams before you got here, and there's a picture of you and Jeff and another guy's face that's blurred out, and you're sitting... <laughs> against a uh, mud wall with a big shit-eating grin on both of your faces and uh, you're talking about a big engagement that just happened the whole night before and I was wondering if I could get both your guys' perspective on what happened that night. Kick it off, Jeff. So that, so that off, I believe, well, first off, man, every, pretty much where our base was, any time we crossed the Anytime we went out on an off, we had to get wet. <laughs> that was given. So when we went out, which was a lot, it was ended up, man, we were usually wet from the waist down. And uh, I think if I, I don't really remember this, that picture, but uh, well, our, our deployment was really broken up in two different, two different uh, areas because of, we started out in uh, kind of a remote area and then we finished it in uh, more of a urban area. Yeah, I do, man. It's that one, that picture was on the very end of the op. I mean, this, the insert exfil, it was over, it was damn near 15K in throughout the oh, night. Yeah, yeah. And I was, that one now. And then, did we, did we find any um, IEDs and, and mortars at that op? Yeah, we did on, on the way there. And then we cleared, a, did a village clearance. We ended up just laughing because that's where we did a VDO. We were waiting yeah, for our VIX to come yeah, in. And it was just so we damn long. Overhead for that op. So I remember, like, it was driving me crazy. All the voices in my head from all the different aircraft we had. That was one of our biggest, one of the biggest ops I, I think we did that deployment because it was just so yeah. long, yep. and we had a lot of people with us. And again, yeah, Jeff said every time we went out, literally we were wet. And then we, I think at the end we were just, everyone was just at such exha exhaustion. Like, so fucking tired. We're leaning post up against this wall, me and Jeff, and then two of our buddies. Actually, two guys next to us were the, our EOD guys. I know you remember them. But uh, we were just fucking bullshitting the shit, just fucking suffering and laughing at the same time because we were so fucking beat to shit. We just patrolled infill all nighter, cleared this big ass village, gotten some ticks, cleared IEDs. We had a lot of overhead. Jeff was dealing all the overhead. And then we exfilled back, humped it back. And that took us all damn day to hump that back that far. And then we were just posted up waiting, sitting there for hours just for our VIX to come get us. It, it, was, it was almost, it was pretty funny. Jeff's been dealing with voices in his head ever since I've known him. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Jeff, when I talked to you and asked you to give a call in, you had a question for Travis about some Carl Gustav rounds. And for you civilian types out there, Carl Gustav is basically a big ass uh, rocket launcher yeah. that's shoulder fired. So, why don't you go ahead and fire that question off, Jeff? Oh yeah, dude. Uh, so the I, I don't know if you remember this, but our, one of the first things when we got to our deployment, uh, it was like the we were there for maybe five days, and we had that that crazy base attack. Do you remember shooting the goose nuts off on that mount, up at the mountain? Hell yeah, I do. Because everyone thought I fuck, a mortar hit me. <laughs> that, that is the start of my hearing loss right there. <laughs> and next to a Carl Gustav without you pro in. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, I, I, dude, I remember that because 
our LPO thought a fucking mortar hit me. Me and Blake were uh, shooting it. Oh, I shot it. He loaded it for me. I staged it right outside in the little uh, triwall, little cardboard box outside of my tent because I couldn't. I, there wasn't any room, so I ran out. I knew I staged it. Grabbed the the goose off. He grabbed the rounds and we fucking ran to the corner of the fob and fucking launched that thing right at the mountain. The same mountain we always got hit at. Literally Holy the same shit. exact mountain every time. Did you get hit from there again? I think so. That was, yeah, we got hit there again. <laughs> Let's get our kid on. Nice. Keep her boots on. How many rounds did you fire? I think I, just a couple. Just a couple? Yeah, but I, I use that more than once. Well, just a couple Carl Gustav rounds. Yeah. Like out of a fucking <laughs> shopping mall. Because our LPO was up on top of that little deck above the kitchen. He looked down and saw like this massive explosion. And he told me yeah. afterwards, he said, my fucking yeah, heart that, stopped. That, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was a big one, dude. That was, they thought they had had up on us because we were fresh. Yeah, they were. They were so our, our base was along the Argandop River, and there was a, the river kind of hides. It, it's it's like a, it, it, we call it the green zone, right? Because it's it has a bunch of trees and vegetation. They snuck in through there and actually were getting close enough, and were launching RPGs at us. And it was a pretty crazy base attack. No shit. Well, Jeff Travis tells me this was probably the most. Uh, the most eventful deployment of the three that uh, he did. What uh, what would you say about that? Oh, definitely, hands down. Because I felt like when we left the wire, when we went right, when we crossed the river and went right, we got shot at every single time. Mm -hmm. When we made a left, we found IEDs about 75% of the time. So it's like, what do we want to do today? Do we want to go blow some IEDs up? What'd you guys do? Flip a coin? <laughs> yeah, so we gotta make sure our route, like we if we go, if we didn't keep a presence south, there'd be IDs everywhere. So we still had to maintain a, you know, a push out, have have our control of that area too. But we preferred to go actually get in a fight. No one likes messing with IDs. Yeah, yeah. And we were debating whether we wanted to get our boots wet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the toughest decision of the deployment, right there. If it was worth it, I'll bet it was worth it to dish out some love to the, you know, local haters. Yeah. But, well, he did. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jeff, thanks for calling in, man. You got any words for Travis before we uh, end the call? Oh, dude, keep crushing it, man. Love seeing what you're doing. And uh, awesome talking with you, bro. Thanks, Jeff. It's good to hear your voice, brother. Hope you're well. All right, Jeff. Of course, Sean, bro. It's awesome talking to you, too, dude. You, too, man. Tell the wife, tell the kid I said hello, and uh, especially uh, Dancer, too. That's my favorite one. So. Yeah, I'll go out and get her some treats for you, man. <laughs> All right. Be safe, Jeff. Later, guys. Bye-bye. It was good hearing his voice. That's the last call, I promise. <laughs> but uh, how's that? Did that take you back? I mean, It did, yeah. Did it make you miss it a little bit, maybe? Yeah. Maybe miss being around guys like Jeff. Yeah. Uh, Honestly, it's been a while since I even talked to him, so it was good to hear his voice and reminisce. Yeah. I don't get to do that often. Yeah, I, none of us are as good as we'd like to be at keeping in touch, and sometimes yeah. the best thing for us, in my opinion, is to you know separate yourself uh, at least for a little while from you know the majority of the community to yeah. kind of find your new way. But <clears throat> so we've already established that your second deployment was a really eventful one. You come back home again for the second time. Did you know you were going back to combat again for a third time? Or? No, I wasn't going, I knew. I was, at that time I was going to BUDS instructor. Oh, okay. You want to become a BUDS instructor? Yeah. Did you want to do that? Yeah. You're ready for a, for a break? Yeah, I was ready. They asked me if 
if I wanted to do something different. And that was the only way I was going to leave. They were trying to force dudes out to go to trade at, at yeah. the time. And I was like, no. I was like, I'm not going there. If I'm going to do something I want to do, I want to be a, a BUDS instructor. Yeah. I want to be at the forefront of the training. Um, and I knew I wanted to be BUDS instructor at first phase. That was like Oh, you my were first goal. phase. Yeah, I was first phase. And that was my goal. You were a total fucking dickhead then. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I was like the quiet... Oh, the quiet man. fucking dickhead, not the outlandish instructor yelling and screaming, but that's like the worst kind. You never know. I what knew the what fuck I wanted. Thinking. Yeah. <laughs> so I said I, I had the opportunity. It was hard to get because the guys going from east to west, it was it's a fate. You know, it's it's yeah. kind of hard to do. Um, leadership's not really prone to let guys do that, but I guess they were said screw it and let me do it. You went to uh, so you come home from deployment. It was a rough one. You guys did a lot of good shit. Got a lot of combat in. You go? Did you go straight to buds as a first phase instructor when yes. you got back? Got back to obviously did term, did some breaks, some leave, cool down, a little R and R. Um, and then as soon as I was done with that, it was literally I got orders to go to buds. I called them ahead of time. I was like, look, I'm coming there. I want to go first phase. And they're like, all right, you got it. No shit. Yeah. And I just checked in. Simple as that. Well, this is interesting because you were so motivated to become a SEAL and and um, talking to your dad that, I mean, he had no doubt you were going to make it. And then you go to combat you, or you make it through, you go to combat, you do two pumps, you had some, you took some heavies, you got a lot of combat time. How did your mentality change? towards, I mean, you show up and you got 200 men, you know, some of them are still fucking kids. Mm -hmm. Others are, um, you know, a little older trying to, you know, prove to themselves they can make it. What, I'm always curious, like, what do you think of the, what do you, when you see 200 people that all want to be exactly what you are and none of them, almost none of them have any fucking idea of what they're about to go through, if in the unlikely event that they make it, yeah. <laughs> um, what, what do you think of the what do you think of the class? Are you right away? I know, you know, eighty percent of them are not going to be there, uh, and I don't say that overtly, but I just know. Yeah. Uh, but I take it. What I've learned when I was an instructor, I was able to. It was definitely a growing experience for me. I would say professionally and maturity, for sure. Just being, once you walk into that, it's just like a bubble, its own world, like as an instructor, even as students, like even, but as an instructor, you're held, you're like, you're on a pedestal, whether you think so or not, you know, you're a god to these students, you know, in their mind, they want to be you. So it's definitely upholding the standard and exceeding the standard. But when I look at students, I just, whenever I saw a fresh class, I've always took it as a fresh start. I mean, they needed to prove themselves to me. I get blank slate for them uh, until proven otherwise. Okay. We had, sometimes we classed up looking at them. Sometimes I, as classes went on, I became inherently just, I could look at a guy and be like, no. No shit. Not happening. Were you ever wrong? couple times yeah yeah the nerdiest looking fucking dweeb sometimes oh yeah it makes, makes it. it huh i mean I, nine times out of ten fucking makes it yeah. and that's people think you know so concerned about size weight strength etc it's those guys that are put out more than i've seen d1 athletes guys with everything like supposed to be athletic studs just quit day one yeah so it's just there's no you can't pinpoint it what I've learned. You can't pinpoint like he's gonna be good. He's not. He's solid. He's not. You know, it's so broad. You know, you just never can tell who wants it more. So as time goes, it's all proven in action. It's like someone could say they want it, but that doesn't mean shit until you're out there. I mean, you've been through a lot at this point. And I mean, did you have any animosity towards the students? Did you want them to quit? Or did you, did you, Talk yes. to me about when you look at a class 
and you have just come from what you've come through and you're still at a young age, I mean, what are you, are you thinking, I'm gonna fucking crush you. You're going to quit or are you thinking? No, I definitely had that mindset with certain individuals, not everybody. Um, I could tell I would get really fucking pissed and angry at certain students just based off their performance and just lack of mental strength and just the want to be there because you hear everything in the wind of why they're there, you know, why they're not performing, et cetera, or quitting. So it was just frustrating to me as well as the other instructors. And I worked, I, I got to work with some seasoned instructors too that have been, majority of them, if not all of them, a couple, all combat. Really? And all the leadership were damn neck. Okay. So seasoned guys. So the tolerance for not putting out or not wanting to be there was zilch for everybody. The patients were. So I got, I, it was so easy. What I learned as an instructor was so easy to see the negative in somebody too. Like we are so quick. This is how we, we spoke about it, like eating your own so fast. Yeah. We are so fast. I found it because I did it just to find a so negative performance in somebody. And they may be doing okay, but as soon as they slip up just a little bit, we're on it. No he may shit. be okay. He may be like overall decent, like up to that point, but maybe just having a bad fucking day or something. But as soon as he has a bad fucking day, we're on him trying to get him out of there. You know, we're just very, it's, I found myself jumping to the negativity so fast mm -hmm. by his, looking at everything like is this guy performing and see what is he doing up to this point what's his reputation in class etc looking at the bigger picture yeah i was always front sight focused on making dudes quit yeah at first which i found out that was kind of like th that was the wrong approach i shouldn't i shouldn't have done that like right out the gate you know that our goal our goal wasn't just to f fucking make dudes quit we want to get rid of the guys who want to be there and, and the program gets rid of the guys yeah. itself it hasn't been changed, a proven system. The guys are going to leave because the curriculum it is what, what it is. Instructors are just there to uphold the standards. Did you did your mindset start to change while you were current while you were in, at first phase as an instructor, or did your mindset change like after you left, thinking back on how everything went? It, it changed while I was there. I would say it changed when I became a proctor of a class. And I was like the lead instructor of class 305. And I really got to get to know the class. I was their guy, I was their conduit between the rest of the instructors. I would meet with them, talk with them, make sure they have all their shit squared away for the next day. Uh, meet with them on the weekends. You know, I, I became close and built a relationship with the guys. At first, I'm just, I'm there to help with scheduling and just help the class and weed out the people that don't want to be there. But as time goes on, you build a relationship because you, you're you with them the entire seven weeks yeah. of first phase. So I grew, that's where I think I definitely grew as an instructor and as a SEAL, as far as maturity is concerned. No shit. Because that responsibility too. Because you're the go-to guy. You're not just another instructor out there yelling and screaming Yeah. You know, at another student. They're looking up to you. Like, hey, they're meeting with you every night. They can go to you to talk to you. And I would meet with them at night and tell them, hey, you're f this is what you're fucking up. This is what you're doing good. This is what you need to be squared away. Or I would remediate them to let them know that, hey, you, you've been fucking up this whole this whole day. Uh, so I definitely definitely grew during that that one class. And then on after that point, the rest of the class I was there, I was there for another six, seven classes. Um, it definitely carried with me throughout. Would you say, maybe not right off the bat, maybe this came later, maybe it didn't come at all, but would you say there is, um, is there any specific common denominator that you're looking for in the guys that are coming through the training? I'm looking that, for that strong why. That strong why, why they wanna do it? Yeah, and everyone has their own, and there's not some blanket statement that's gonna be good enough. But everyone has their own reasons why, but it has to be, for me, what I saw a lot of, it wasn't about the job. It was more about, I just wanna do buds, or I just wanna try challenge. Yeah, That was it, that was like the sole focus. And yeah, in itself, it is a challenge. 
yeah, you should want to complete buds. That, but that's just a stepping stone to becoming a Navy SEAL. That's just not, that's not the end-all, be-all. And I found a lot of the students didn't really know why the hell they were there. Vice just being there just because they saw it online or, you know, they woke up one day and started to prepare six months or less than that for BUDS. Yeah. And, yeah, they met the standards to get there, but that's it. You yeah. Know, just because you could pass a, a SEAL PST doesn't mean you're going to make it through. And it doesn't, and honestly, when you have a week, I tell these guys, people all the time, if you have a week, why, or that trickles down in your motivation, everything, you're going to get weeded out quick. That why is not going to hold up against all the demands that especially first phase requires of you. Yeah. You know, that's that's going to get in and out of your mind quick. So if you're, if you don't want to be a SEAL and do the fucking job down range, what, you know, when I was there, weren't too many people still going overseas. Yeah, so, it kind of died down there. Yeah, it died down bit. right when I got back because my last point I finished in 2013. And then we're slowly kind of removing guys from Afghanistan, especially the team guys. Yeah. So barely anyone was going there when I was an instructor. So I don't think they it maybe just didn't have a clue or didn't really think about it. But again, this is not a, a blanket statement for every student, but for the people that quit or I saw lack of performance and when I especially when I was a proctor and spoke to him it was that it kind of all boiled down to that it wasn't like oh my legs hurt I'm tired it was, it was like I was like why the hell are you even here makes sense is there <clears throat> as much as we eat our own and we do eat our own and we're probably the best out of it out of all the all the other branches uh which I don't necessarily think is a fucking good thing but at the same token, we're also extremely fucking tight knit and we have each other's back on deployment. We might not, I might not like you, I might not want to be around you, but when you're on deployment, things change and you have to have that fucking teamwork. So, as an instructor, do you teach that or? Is that something that you think that guys come to the table with that it's just like in their heart? It comes to, I think guys show up with that, they come to the table with that kind of mentality already. That's why they're there. That's what kind of drove, part of the reason why it probably drove them to the program. Mm -hmm. There's, we don't give them no PowerPoint on being a team player, teamwork. It's just, it's driven into them like right away. Even before they even phase up to first phase, it's like you're in boat crews, you're in a class, you're part of a team, you're part of a unit, you need to work together. Otherwise, you're gonna fail, you know. So that the program does it in, inherently, and then we're there to reinforce it and make yeah. sure that that standard is held. When you have guys that show up that aren't team players, and a lot of times these are your Division One types, Division One athletes, Olympic athletes. Sometimes it's guys from other branches that are just crushing the fucking runs, crushing the swims. They're the top performers, but, and then they want to gloat and they want to be fucking praised for how well they're performing, but they're not a team player. How do you, is it hard to get those guys to quit? Do you try to get them to quit? I've always seen them, um, it kind of, just like you said, the program kind of takes care of its, takes. Yeah, you know, takes care of itself. How do how do those guys wind up washing out? I think the majority they, they do wash out. Um, the program will expose them, and then so will the class. To be honest with you, because they see right through that shit, and they're not. And even the class leaders and the boker leaders, they may be in charge, may not be. You know, even they may be just a lower ranking, but a D one athlete or something, or maybe an officer. Uh, but even still they're going to get exposed and they'll be oust by the, by the class pretty quickly. When I see when I was an instructor, we touched on it, that social pressure. Um, and if you're not a part of the team, you're going to be quickly cut out of the team. Yeah. Cause that, and that happens quick too. And then w instructors will kind of help and reinforce that as well. We help, they? we help, Hey, what's up with this guy? You know what? You guys going to do something about it? talk to the class leader, maybe he's a boat crew leader, or maybe he's an officer. We talked to the class OIC to talk to him. So 
there's ways to expose that if we see, because maybe he'd be crushing passing every test, but again, he's standing out because he's not being a part of the team. He thinks he's above the rest. Those things you could see quickly in buds, those okay. little discrep those discrepancies in people. Even as an instructor? Yeah. Do you it think you out. see it faster as an instructor as you do as a student? Oh, this class would, would see it before us. Okay. Yeah, the, the, his own boat crew would definitely see it before us. Because in those, those occasions, that, those arrogance, um, that entitlement, you know, may not show because he could be passing tests. He could be passing all the runs, the swims. So he could kind of slip by a little bit because he's performing. Uh, just on a performance standard, but as soon as we start doing team evolutions, the boats, the logs, rock pours, surf passes, etc., that's when people like that start showing okay. because he's not putting out. He's just in the same position all the time. He's not moving, holding his weight. He's not shifting like for the boats, boats on heads, like number two spot, which is directly in the middle of the boat, the heaviest spot where all the water goes, kind of rests in the center, and it bows too, so all the weight kind of centers in the boat. He'll never go to that position, or if he's on the logs, he'll never go to the end of the log where mm -hmm. all the weight lies. Everyone tries, all the turds of people who don't want to put out, don't want to be part of the team, go to the center where they could pretend like they're carrying something. Yeah. Because everyone else in the end is carrying the weight. So there's, they know, they find out these little tricks that we know of. The instructors see this, we see it all the time. And we pick up on it because this, we see the same faces. In the class, we'll see it too, but we notice the same exact faces, the same spot every time. Yeah. How do you deal with that as an instructor? Do you do you give them like a little extra? Give them extra attention. Extra benefit. Oh yeah. To entice them to ring the bell. We'll give or? them some extra motivation. Yeah. We'll How definitely would you do that. If we notice something during the evolution, we'll shift them to the spot where we think it's the toughest. Would like you humiliate logs. him in front of the entire class? Humiliate him, no. No? Not humiliate. Okay. We would tell him if he was doing what I just described, we would tell him to go back to the position, to the two spot or the end of the log and stay there. Okay. And you're going to stay there until you either quit or you start putting out for your boat crew. Um, more often than not, they tend to fall out yeah. or start collapsing their whole entire boat crew because they're not holding their weight and everyone else starts carrying more load, more tired. It's just like a snowball effect. Everyone yeah. starts dying off. So I, I've, always, always, I've always been like really curious about, like you get these guys sometimes, I, and I never was you know, an instructor, so this is why I'm so curious, is you get these guys that they just can't fucking hang, they don't put out, the boat crew is basically, um, you know, carrying them through Hell Week, especially, and nobody seems to be able to force these fuckers to quit, and but they do wind up disappearing. So, if you got a guy and you're an instructor who he's not cutting it, his boat crew's suffering, he's not a team player, he's hanging on by a thread because he just won't ring the fucking bell. Like, how how does he like how do we get disappear? Rid of him? We, it's pretty easily actually for, we just wrote, write them up performance wise. You just performance drop performance them right there? Performance drop them. No shit. He's over a series of evolutions, mm -hmm. not just one time, yeah. but over a series of evolutions over a couple of days, maybe a week of just not performing or hacking it after being warned, done. And we just pull them from the class. Okay. Sometimes people do squeak by though, that being said. You know, but yeah, performance drop. Okay, would be the way to get we get rid of these guys. I have another question too. I've never actually met a buds quitter. I don't know if you have this too, but everybody seems to get oh yeah medical dropped. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've I've met a ton of buds quitters, but nobody ever admits that. They right. always say, "Oh, I've been med dropped." And I know when I was going through buds, they would actually give. Um, they would give them a choice like, well, you know, would you like to be med dropped? And mm -hmm. uh, is that is that how that goes? You just tell them, ah, oh, yeah, you don't have to ring it. Just 
No. Okay. Nope. If a student clearly just wants to DOR or drop drop on request, he has to ring the bell. Okay. Cut and dry. But if it's for a medical, it's the only reason he's going to get med dropped if it's for a severe medical issue. I'm talking severe because right now they, at least when I was there, my experience has a very good medical system there, and they'll rehab you up. Yeah. They will rehab the student back to full health and put him back in the class. If he injured stress fractures or whatever that was like kind of induced because of the training, they'll rehab you up and get you back in the class. Um, if your performance dropped, your performance dropped. It's not like, hey, do you want just to write down a med drop? Yeah. But you really got performance dropped? Or okay. you DOR and we just wrote down you got med dropped? No way. Yeah. You quit, you quit. I think it, and I've come across that to myself. They're lying. They're just uh, just straight up just they don't want to admit to themselves or others that they just quit. Just a flat out liar. Just flat out liar. And I have met a couple guys where they've approached me like, no, I quit. Or they just straight up. And those are far few in between. But I respect that more than, yeah. you know, I don't hold it against them. I don't give a shit. But it's not for everyone. Yeah, it's not for everyone. But if, yeah, if you're straight up, that those people who do that are just straight liars. So they're lying to themselves but because we don't give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> I've met a ton of med yeah. drops. I've never met a quitter. Yeah, so yeah, same here. <laughs> Which is kind of funny. Let's dive into the infamous hell week. You went through it. I went through it. When you go back as an instructor and you see what these guys are going through in hell week and, and you've already done it, I mean, does it, does it look as bad as when you were going through it? Does it look worse? Does it look the same? I, I don't know. As an instructor, it's like that behind the curtain look. Yeah. But it definitely looks worse as a student. Does it? Yeah. As an instructor, it's not that bad. Um, I mean, but it's by no means has it changed. It's, it's tough as hell. Uh, but I don't know. When I look, I could hardly remember. When I look back, think back at my hell week, yeah. I could hardly remember some evolutions. Yeah, did, as an instructor, I mean, I can remember it because I used to work with tons of them, but working them as an instructor, so I remember everything. Would you say that was your favorite evolution to work as an instructor? Uh, camp surf. Camp surf? Oh, camp surf, yeah. We call it camp surf. It's like Wednesday night. So midweek, kind of Wednesday night, dudes made it because that following day is like messing around, then you're doing the round the world till you're done. But camp surf's like middle of night, by the old course, build this huge fire pit and then huge pit right next to it where all the students lie and it's like they make a little stage and they tell us jokes and their jokes shit. We send them to the surf zone, laugh at them. And if they're good, let them go stand by the fire for a couple minutes, warm them up. And then kind of the whole class will go through it and then we'll punish them. Occasionally we had a tradition where we brought them food. Punish them how? If they've fallen asleep. Mm -hmm. We fucking wake them all up, send them to the surf middle of the night, surf hit after surf hit after surf hit. That's the worst thing in Hell Week. Yeah. We would just do hundreds of hit the surf, hit the surf, hit the surf. I mean, these guys are just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that water is freezing ass. How Freezing ass in the middle of the night. What's the temp? 50s. 50s? Mid, yeah. Mid-50s at night. Summertime, it's a little bit warmer. I would say six, in the like low 60s to mid-60s, even then. Whether it's summer, winter, doesn't matter because we just keep you in the water longer. And trust me, you're gonna freeze just as much if you froze in the winter time, even in the summer. Yeah. You know, like you watch Discovery, you watch, you know, all the, the Hollywood class and the documentaries and you read the books and now they see all the pictures on um, social media and stuff. But these guys watching Discovery Channel, they they see they see guys rolling around in the surf and carrying logs and carrying boats, but what they don't, what they don't see is, is the shit that you can't see that you know as an instructor and, and you find out real fast as a student, like the chafing from the sand and in your armpits, on your groin, on your junk, and uh, you know, from the sand rubbing back and forth and that dries and I feel like the instructors know it dries and that's camis are like stuck to the side of your sack. And as soon as the class is dry, it's like, hey, we're gonna go for a run. As soon as you run, 
those pants are crusted to that chafing and it rips the skin right off everything. And then, so that burns like hell. And then it's, hey, get your ass back in the water. And then you're throwing an open wound into the water. And are, do you guys, I mean, do you guys take, do you realize, do you remember that shit when you were going through? Do you know that's going on with the class? I mean, oh yeah, we, I know, we know what's going on because it's happening. When I was a student, I knew it was going on because I was living it. So it was the rest of the class. Some got it worse than others. Um, and like I said, when we, every morning they get med checks. So we, they get seen by a doctor and get, if it's horrible, they'll get it treated or they'll get it bandaged. But again, as instructors, we're not holding up training because we know some students have chafing. Some may have it way worse than others. I mean, I've seen students that were literally covered in chafe. Arms, armpits, chest, waist, groin, legs. I mean, it looked like they just fell off a motorcycle on the street. I mean, it's horrible how Shit. bad some people get affected. Some people get affected more than others. I don't know why. Um, but I, it doesn't, we don't alter, alter training because students are uh, experiencing some burn pains <laughs> because of chafing. <laughs> if anything, that's just part of the process. And hey, man, if you can't handle that, then get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a burning sensation in my groin. Yeah, Can you help like, me out? Welcome to the SEAL team. Welcome to SEAL <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, just, that's part of the process of welcome to the SEAL team. Exactly. Yeah. In Hell Week, is there a specific evolution where guys start dropping off immediately? Is, or is it always random? Like, is it is it breakout when you're breaking them out of the tents? Is it log DT? Is it, or, or? It's not breakout, to be honest with you. We don't lose a lot of guys. If we're going to lose a lot, only time we ever lose right when Hell Week starts is before it even kicks off because we lock them down into a, a tent or a room before Hell Week kicks off like two, three hours prior. Then we'll get some stragglers that will just walk up and ring out before Hell Week even because they can't handle the stress. And they're not even doing anything. They're just watching a movie laid up eating. So we'll get some stragglers. But it's not until maybe that night when we're doing base tour, boats on heads. I'm just oh. running all over Bud's compound and across the street to the dry side, running all over there. Uh, and then maybe doing also another one, Steel Pier, oh, we yeah. call it, which we just, the whole evolution is just all about freezing the students. Yeah. Just a mental mental gut check. What happens when a student gets hypothermia? Is that end of the evolution or is that end of the evolution for that specific student? Depends on the severity, but it's just that this the... Evolution continues on. We just pull him out. Okay. Rewarm him if we can. If it's something we can deal with. If it's severe, then we'll, with our ambulance, drive him back to the, the clinic. But uh, nine times out of ten, we could just handle it on the spot. Get a quick temp, warm him up, put a blanket around him, dry him off, beanie, coat, etc. for a little while, which I feel is like the worst thing because we <laughs> warm him up. And then as soon as he's good to go, like he's coherent, he's back to normal, he's like all cozy and falling asleep. We're like, hey, wake the fuck up. Go hit the surf. Get your ass back out there. Get your ass there. back out there. <laughs> Start training if you want to be here. Yeah. Would you say the majority of the quarters come from the first night? Say so the first, yeah. First 24 hours, Yeah, maybe. first 24 hours. 24 to 32 hours, I'd say. We get the majority. By the middle, of the end of the middle of the week, end of the Wednesday night, um, you, have, you pretty much have what you're going to have at the end of the hell week. Yeah. Whether if someone gets hurt, then you get some. But as far as quitters are concerned, pretty much stop Wednesday night going to Thursday morning. When Hell Week is secured as an instructor, do you, and you're looking at 20 guys out of 150 who just made it through what's only what, three or four fucking weeks in, do you feel any sense of pride for those individuals that have uh, gutted that out? as an instructor looking looking at them and knowing what they're getting ready to go to next? Oh, oh yeah, definitely a huge accomplishment on their end. Uh, and they've earned a level of respect, at least how I viewed it. And then other instructors did too when I was there. And it, it kind of proved to me that they're, they, for one, they want to be there. For two, they're ready to get trained. Up until that point, now we can start, we had the core of guys that want in this class that want to be here because we just they just passed the most grueling part of selection now it's time to kind of put them to the test other ways but we have a solid foundation of the guys that that want to be here because not going to get any quitters after that very very 
rare. Yeah. Um, it's mostly just performance or medical issues, but that it's definitely a level of respect and they've proved to us that they're ready to be trained. After Hell Week, it becomes, man, I don't want to word this wrong, but it's a little bit of pressures off. You just made it through, um, you know, the hard, it is the hardest evolution in buds in my opinion. And it is a night and day difference coming from Hell Week into into uh, post Hell Week. You know, one day you're wearing a white shirt, you graduate Hell Week, you're a brown shirt. And then you get a little bit more respect, at least when I was going through, you get a little bit more respect. Is it hard to like switch that mindset as an instructor or is it still like that? No, it's still like that. You do get a little more of a level of respect from the instructors. Because like I said, after that, we the training kind of shifts. They break up into squat their own squads, and we s start kind of building that platoon mindset, um, and actually train start teaching them kind of some core skills of being a SEAL. Uh, but that is, that is a real fine line, though, because sometimes students take it a little too far, like they've been made it, they're fucking good, they're good to go, but then we quickly crush that <laughs> if they're getting a little too arrogant. <laughs> yeah. So I've seen that happen a lot with classes. You know they. Finish Hell Week, they think they're fucking good to go. They made it, got the brown shirt, um, or fucking a cloud nine. But we squash it and they never happen again. It's usually th the proctors that sniff through that shit and they, they hammer it. You're looking at one. I got squashed yeah. right after Hell Week. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, and looking at these guys as they're going through, I mean, you always have in the, in the back of your mind, you might be you might be with that guy that you're instructing in, I mean, fuck it, what, a year? In combat, taking fire, engaging the enemy, and that's always in the back of your mind. Have you ever worked with any of the guys you put through buds when you went back to the team? Yeah, I worked with a couple. How was that relationship? It was good. I mean, it was definitely knowing them when the instructor, it was a different dynamic, um, but I ended up being some of them, L their LPO. Yeah. So it was actually a good relationship. It wasn't uncomfortable or, cause, but at first they saw me as like an instructor when they got to the team and in my platoon. So they already had that mindset like, holy shit, you know, that's instructor Kennedy. Um, but that quickly faded when I just set the tone of, hey, you're a new guy, I'm your teammate, you know, I'm your LPO, but, but it, it didn't, it wasn't a negative thing at all. I actually kind of liked it. It was kind of it was kind of really cool to see them there and buds. The progression. The progression. Now they're actually with me, and actually as a team doing the job. So it was, it was cool to see that process. That's why I liked first phase. That's why I wanted to go to first phase because that that growth. Yeah. Through all that the, the the meat of the selection, and then the outcome at the yeah. end. So. That's what that's what the, the reason why I like that phase a lot. I mean, shit is pretty fucking cool. I mean, you're, I mean, you're basically like the gatekeeper of the community, mm -hmm. being a first phase instructor, or the you know the biggest. I mean, that's the biggest hurdle. Yeah, being an instructor and and uh, going back when these guys graduate, buds and and SQTD. I mean, because you're part of that entire pipeline at least a little bit. Um, do you feel like these guys are ready? Once they finish BUDS or yeah. SQT? Yeah, are they yeah, ready I do. to go? Yeah, I feel like they're ready. Uh, the end product is solid. Um, well, even while I was instructor, I know today it is too. So the program is what it is for a reason and it produces really good team guys. You know, that's my opinion and that's what I've seen and that's what I know is true, but the outcome is great. Um, here and there, you know, get some stragglers that get to the team and don't perform, and they kind of look back and like, what the fuck, what, buds? Why'd you let this guy sl slip through? But that's small. You know, that, that happens sometimes. We can't really. We do our best to mitigate it, but it can only do so much. Is there anything? you would like to see implemented in buds that you think will prepare guys more for showing up to the team or 
prepare them more for like the mindset to make a better seal. Is there anything you would like to see implemented uh, in Into the BUDS the program. program as an instructor that would make a better team guy an end result? Yeah, I would say we, for the leadership, let the, the instructors do their job, which will produce a better result as per a student, because you give them restrictions, they're not gonna be able to enforce the standards, which then trickles down to the, they're not going to have the right mindset going forward. They're not, they're not doing well with the teamwork, you know, that men, team mentality, uh, et cetera, mental toughness. So when your hands are tied from the top, that's going to trickle down into the class because the, your, the class is a direct reflection of the instructing staff mm -hmm. and how much they uphold the standards and all the, the, the physical aspect and everything else. So, what I do like at the very, when I was there at the very end, they did implement the mentors. I think they need to hammer that a little bit home more. They assign instructors, they split the class up into squads and they assign an instructor to each squad as like a mentor. Oh, really? So they kind of hammer down, go full force on that. That way you build relationships with these guys. And I got to do it one time because they started, it was a fairly new thing. But those guys that I mentored were later on in my platoon working for me. No shit. So I thought it was a really cool tool. You really get to like get in the mindset. They could ask you questions and you're actually out there teaching them kind of the fundamentals of being a SEAL uh, and building that relationship. And it paid dividends, which I saw throughout the rest of the phases. Because um, like you said, you, you know, you're going to be working with majority of these guys. Yeah. Most of the instructors, if they leave buds and go onto them a team or something, you're gonna be working with these guys. So you need to have and and you get to understand where they're at too mentally. You know, are they in the right mindset? Do they have the right characteristics? You know, whether we. That's how we get to know these people. You know, yeah. some psych exam they took before is not like a good, very good marker whether they're gonna be a good team guy or not. They're still trying to figure out how to find the best candidates today. Yeah. They still can't, and I don't think they ever will, but being more intimately involved and like knowing the guys, that's gonna help. Getting to know actually who they are exactly. as a person. What's who, inside there. Yeah. Who they are, then you understand like why they're here. Yeah, that makes a hell of a lot of sense. Where they come from, where, you know, what they used to do, what are they into? Why do you wanna be a SEAL? You know, what are you interested in doing? Yeah. And I think, cause a SEAL, which I like the SEAL community, like we're from everywhere, you know? So many different backgrounds, so many different professions. Yeah, and that's what you know come together is for just one purpose. That's why I like the teams a lot. One yeah. of the great aspects of it, but they just hammer home on that a lot more. And I, I think they still are, but just really focus on that post hell week end of first phase. I mean, that's you know that's actually very refreshing to hear that your you as an instructor as a combat uh, vet are comfortable with the product that's coming out of the training center and showing up to the teams. I mean, that's like, that's, I mean, shit, that's all you can ask for, you know, is a solid individual coming out of that pipeline, ready to fucking go to work. Yeah. 99% of them are freaking solid. It's the one percenters that mess up and then they make everybody work bad. And that's just how it's always been. That's how it always will be. Yeah. As soon as someone messes up, then everybody looks bad. Then they start spotlights like what kind of product you've given us when one turd shows up into the team not performing when the 15 other team new guys are that showed up are doing solid and all of a sudden we're producing bad people yeah it's just a numbers game of probability at that point but like i said we're going back again we always so quick to talk about the negative or bring that about yeah advice you know hey let's handle it internally so that's Going back again, that's what I've learned as an instructor. Like, just take a bigger picture. Like, hey, let's get to know these dudes. And that'll leave you a lot of problems in the future, a lot of issues when they get to the team out and leave, liberty, et cetera, like their personal time, getting in trouble with the law, et cetera. Like, all these little things probably could have gotten caught going through the program, knowing where this guy is, what he's been doing. Maybe he has all these fucking red flags throughout buds, like drinking, et cetera, which there has been. 
Mm. So that could have been found out a lot earlier before they showed up to the team causing a scene. Yeah. So. So moving along, you finish up your time at Buds, and then you go back to the teams. What team did you go back to? Four again. It went back to four. And where were you going this time? This time I got assigned to three troops. So I knew it was Southcom. At the time, it was one troop was going to Africa, two was UCOM, and three troops was Southcom. So four, Team Four went back to its roots. Southcom was his AO because uh, all CENTCOM kind of died off. East Coast teams were not going there at all. Uh, the most kinetic place was Africa. And you know, even that wasn't nearly as kinetic as Afghanistan when I went there. So I ended up going to Columbia, did my LPO tour, um, and went to Southcom. How was that deployment? I liked it. Honestly, it was a really good deployment. I enjoyed it. It was very, very different than the first two I experienced. I mean, it was a little night and day difference. Yeah. Um, working with the embassy, other, you know, host nation partner forces, a lot of FID, uh, those who don't know foreign internal defense, we're just training um, the local special forces a lot. That was the main kind of main gig there. We're look, working with a lot of interagency. There was DEA, mm -hmm. CIA there. So we worked alongside of them. We helped train their forces. Um, so a lot of joint, little joint advise and assist ops. Um, what kind of ops? Were they counter drug? Counter, counter drug. Counter, all of them were counter narcotic and local um, within like their city. They, they utilized their military special forces to do basically police work Okay. Um, in the city. So it's a little different dynamic than like we Like investigation have. type work or undercover uh, work or as a... DAs, I would just go in and oh, have a target and like, hey, we're gonna go and arrest this guy. Okay, um, so they're hitting houses. They're hitting houses, yeah. Cool, yeah, are you with them? Yeah, we're parked a block over in the street. Okay, you're command and control, you're... Yeah, we did a, a advising and assisting them. We're not up there on the, the train or anything. We're just sitting in our up armored Vic a block over doing overwatch. Okay. Make sure everything goes smooth. Are you proud of these guys? Do you get attached to them? Towards the end, I did. Yeah. Uh, we helped also helped develop their whole selection um, process as well for their special forces unit. So I myself being like the lead lead guy down there in that part of Columbia had a lot invested in this and I was proud of the the product because we helped stand up their course which produced their quote unquote operators yeah so and I was pretty pleased on how motivated and effective it was and how much time and effort they they put into it they took it seriously so this is like a whole new this is a completely different mission than what you're used to being overseeing foreign nationals operate in their own country and uh, training them what to do and how to do everything. And it sounds like you really enjoyed that. And it was a nice change from yeah, it the was. Middle East. <laughs> it was definitely an, a complete 180. I did a little bit of FID when I was in the Middle East, uh, just a little bit. But this one was, that was kind of the main focus to give us access and placement in that country, regardless. And that's, that's what SEALs do. I mean, that's what we do. The majority of the job, when we're not at war, that's what team guys do. So we got to have the fit is important. It's part of the mission. Guys don't like it, but um, it needs to be done. Yeah. So we did a lot of that, uh, but I enjoyed my time there. I mean, it was being in that AO was pretty comfortable in Columbia. So. And that was your last deployment. That was my last one. Yeah. How long after your last deployment did you leave, decide to separate out of uh, the community? So I finished that deployment and then went to trade at um, the training command for two years. Oh, good. I ended up being, I made chief, I ended up being the chief of SALC, Special Operations Urban Combat, just another, it's just a training division in the, the big umbrella of all of the divisions. Just, I just taught, was in charge of one of them. And I did that for two years. Uh, spent a lot of time in Kentucky. That's where our, our training was. Um, out there so 
So mount for use civilian types is basically urban warfare. It's moving as a team, uh, small unit tactics in and out of uh, urban environments, downtown cities, um, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Heavily focus on that, leadership skills, communication. Uh, we did a lot of shooting, CQC, yeah. close quarters combat. Uh, that was kind of the culmination of the workup for guys, the assaults block. Kind of what everyone, all the team guys look forward to because it's the best block. All, all the team guys want to do assaults. Yep. They all want to do CQC, all want to shoot shit, all want to do DAs. So that's what that block is. Um, but so I learned a lot. I, I learned a hell of a lot of, you know, things about being a SEAL, new skills, sharpened my skills. Um, learned a lot more leadership stuff. Just big, kind of bigger pictures, kind of staff stuff, being in that role, being like a chief of a cell. Yeah. Um, but it was two years. I mean, for our generation, that block of training, CQC, hitting houses, urban movement, all that kind of stuff, I mean, that is the, I think without a doubt, the single most important training block that we have uh, with what's going on in the world today. And I'd love to hear your take on, I mean, you've been out, you've done it three times. Now you were a buds instructor. Now you're teaching, and you're seeing, you're you're seeing the final product do what they want to do and what they do best. What does that look like uh, from the outside, kind of looking in? I mean, are you like, holy shit, like these guys are fucking good, or we've got a lot of work to do? I think it's the majority are pretty solid, but again, we need more time needs to be spent on it. We don't spend enough time. Uh, they, t they took away a week from the training. The training's three weeks long. Uh, SOC was assault blocks is two weeks long, so a total of five weeks, total assault block. Um, but more time is needed because that is like the, the meat of the skill set. Yeah. And if we're focusing more of attention on diving or mobility or we're taking away, if they if people higher up see that maybe more of a, a priority, then they're going to take away. They took they have taken away time from the assault block because they don't see that it's necessary. We need to focus our efforts maybe on more maritime. Were you impressed with the product coming out of that? The teams. I had mixed. Through. I had a mixed feelings sometimes. No shit. Yeah, I think it was. I could name the teams. I'm not going to. But I can name the teams that I liked, uh, that that really impressed me. But I can the teams that were like, Ugh, like they need more work. They just need more time. They, yeah. They just didn't do it enough. They didn't do enough. What happens is that they just don't do enough prep work prior to the assault block on their own time. Okay. So they're not taking it upon themselves to go rent out the kill house to do runs with older guys teaching new guys and just doing those reps before they get there to set themselves up for success. And it shows. Yeah. Let's move on towards transition. And I mean, there's all this preparation that goes into going to combat, doing the job right, making sure you're a team player, all that stuff. And when I was in, there was no preparation for guys that are leaving. Uh, that kind of a job, that kind of, you know, the things that you see and the things that you do, there was zero preparation for it. And what do you think about that? And how was your separation? Were you nervous? Yeah, I was nervous. I knew about a year out that I was, I was gonna make the decision. Um, so I, I've already I stuck to what I felt was right for me. So I knew I was gonna get out. Uh, but as far as like knowing what to do, are people helping me? None. I mean, very limited. Other than I, I really had to seek out, and more often not, it was people outside the community, not inside. Yeah. Because if I, I told the first time I ever, I told my leadership, I mean, and job out dropped to the floor, like, what the hell are you doing? You know, it was more like, and then afterwards, it was I felt more like, hey, they're like, hey, fuck you, like, you're leaving. Yeah. So that stigma is still floating around there are it's just kind of it what i've noticed is based on person to person it's not in general but 
but about a year out, I prepped, uh, try to line everything up myself, get as much information as I can. Um, at the time, I was thinking, I was like really going back and forth what I wanted to do with my life after the teams. Yeah. Before we get into that, before we get into after you're gone, sure. I heard you say in another podcast about, um, you talked about going and seeing uh, psychiatrists and docs on your way home from deployment. We didn't have that when I was in. And even if we did, I don't know that any of us would have opened up. Maybe it would have helped us, maybe it wouldn't have. Do you, what kind of questions were they asking? Did they seem genuine? Were they there to help? Did you open up to them? The ones post every deployment, I didn't really feel they were genuine. It's more of a check in the block. Okay. Because we, the, after the Afghan deployments, both of them, we stopped um, in a town to take a weekend break before, um, it was in the States. We just took a weekend break and then we had a, every morning we wake up, meet like a certain type of doctor and it was more of a check in the block box for them. Like, hey, you feeling good? Check. Oh, he's all right. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until like I was actually getting out. Now they have programs set in place. They have warrior concussion clinic. You know. So they have like these clinics set up for guys, especially special operators, that they really dive deep and get a full body. Like what's going on with you? Open it up. They, you know, everything from head to toe, they do. And honestly, it's a really good program. And Is they it? They take it seriously now because in the past they didn't give two shits about this stuff. Yeah, and it's they didn't even think about it nor paid attention to it. So nowadays it's more prevalent. Uh, so they did. I went through that, saw the psych a handful of times. Um, at first I was, I don't, I don't think I ever really opened up. I mean yeah. I I talked a little bit, uh, the beginning the first couple times I went no I didn't at all. Um, I only went five times, but. The last three times I talked a little bit, I opened up some more, I progressively opened up a little bit more, but by the time I was already out, yeah. you know, I was already like front sight focus on, I wanted to get this done. It was part of the transition to go through this medical exam. It was like a month long. Yeah. So I needed to get that done before I got out. Uh, but that being said, it, I felt it did help me though. It because did. part of that program to see all these different doctors and talk to them. It did help me. And there was a whole other, I got to do a physical thing for physical rehab plan, got to see chiropractors, uh, massage therapy, float tank therapy. Shit, they really stepped it up. Yeah, so that's a whole nother month long too. So there are these programs to really kind of, before you get out to kind of just get your head right. Yeah. I felt like it did for me. It, helped, it got my head right a little bit. Got me back on level ground and kind of kept me focused on my next move. Because before that, I was like, I thought I knew what I was going to do, but we'll yeah. get to that. But it's like, I'm really grateful that they have that now. You got out. I know you tried out for a law enforcement agency. I'm not sure which one. You didn't make it. And why don't you tell us a little bit about who you were trying out with and why you think maybe you didn't make it. So I applied for the FBI, I would say almost a damn near a year before I got out. Um, me and a couple other guys did. About, I would say about the last 10 months. So I went through the entire, not the entire, because I didn't make it, but three quarters of the process. And I thought, this is it. This is what I want to do, great job do good things, serve my country still, just in a different capacity. Um, so I was really stoked about this. I thought I was going to be the exception to the rule. I've told you this about having issues transitioning. I thought it was going to be, boom, just transfer right over. Like, get out, get right back into a federal job. Simple. I tried to time it just right so I wouldn't, there's no lag time whatsoever. I went through all the process, and it was after the background check, all the background stuff. I got a letter saying no. So I, I, it's had something to do with the background for me, probably the polygraph. Um, don't know why they don't tell me. Yeah. They don't tell you there is more. I just took it, did all the background check paperwork, everything. And 
simply, I didn't know until about a month after I actually got out and moved to California. Actually, well, I drove to California just to visit. Mm -hmm. No intentions on staying because I still had the foresight of I'm, I made it. Like, I'm good. I'm going to get this job. Because I thought at that point, because I crushed everything up to that point, and I thought my polygraph and background was pretty solid. It was solid. Um, but then I got an email saying, nope. Hmm. Like, hey, it was a formal thing. I can't remember what it said, but it was very vague. It was like, hey, you didn't meet the, the requirements, yeah. et cetera. You know, it's, it's always interesting to me because so many guys from special operations community, I mean, there just aren't there many jobs that translate. There, there, I mean, there's barely any to what our experience is and what we can offer. <clears throat> and a lot of guys seem to flock to the federal side uh, of law enforcement or uh, other government agencies and, you know, state and local law enforcement agencies. And it seems like it's the same story over and over. These guys get out just like yourself. They apply for some type of law enforcement organization and then they get the letter that says they're not they don't have what they're looking for. Yeah, some bullshit. Which I find like really that. odd. You know, you're you're a shooting instructor now. You teach tactics and you teach law enforcement. Don't you find that kind of odd that so many guys come out, they apply to law enforcement agencies, the law enforcement agency tells them, hey, thanks, but you're not good enough. And then six months later, they're fucking calling you up wanting you to come and train their top fucking tier guys at that agency to do their job. Don't you find that a little odd? Yeah. It's extremely odd. It's mind-blowing, actually. Yeah. And I didn't really think about it until I trained my first group of law enforcement. Uh, but you're right. It's like it's, it's unreal to me that they would pass up such, in my mind, solid individuals that would do good things for their community. Yeah. Um, so I don't know their agenda on that one. But again, yeah, fast forward today, I train cops all the time. Yeah. But yet, these even State Department will say no. Because yeah. I've actually, after that, after I got that letter, and I was like internally humiliated and ashamed because mm -hmm. I was like a huge blow to my ego. I didn't tell anybody at first because I was at my dad's and he was standing right there. And I was like, I didn't even want to tell him, but he was standing right there. I was like, well, here we go. No go on this. And I was like, kind of like, damn. Like, yeah. now what? Because I didn't have any plan. At that time, you put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. You were going to work for FBI. You thought you were a shoe-in, only to find out, according to them, uh, you're not good enough. And I heard you on a podcast also. I think it was right before that happened, maybe. You, they asked you about transition, and you're, you were like, oh, yeah, it's a fucking breeze. And now you've got nothing, no plan, nothing going on. You've been denied. I mean, you're living with your dad. Yeah, it was horrible. It and was you're a fucking 13 year veteran Navy SEAL. Yeah, I was embarrassed. <laughs> I mean, cause I didn't have anywhere to go. I moved out of my place in Virginia. I left some things there, but I brought the majority of my, you know, I had some stuff here. I just drove across country to spend some time with him. That was my intention is I got, the letters say no go. Then I was there at my dad's living there. I was living at my dad's at 31 years old. Just did almost 13 years of service SEAL. Had everything going for me. And now I'm like, now what? So it was, it was pretty tough, like mentally for me. Mm -hmm. So I was like scrambling. How to, tough on a scale of one to 10? Probably one of the hardest things I had to do. Probably 10, 9 yeah. to 10, you know, up, way up there. As far as mentally. Yeah. But just like ego, just... Because I thought I had my shit together. Yeah. I like to think I still do. But at the time, I was like, damn, like, I'm, I, I never would have thought in a million years I'd be like at 31 living at my dad's. Yeah. 
I didn't live there very long, but I had to live there because I had nowhere to go. Yeah. And I had no job. So, and I had no idea what the hell I was going to do. Um, so I was living off savings. I had money, but I was living off my savings just from work and stuff like that. I was in the service. But again, me being who I am, I was stressing. Yeah. And again, I applied for another local law enforcement. I don't know why I did that, but I did because I was like, what's the quickest thing I could do here? Um, applied for the Orange County Sheriff's. Uh, didn't, I, I didn't go through the process. I just didn't even show up. I got invited to do an interview and all that. I just didn't even show up because I was yeah. like, fuck that. Yeah. I just, in my gut, I had a gut feeling this wasn't for me. So I just didn't go. You know. But now I am where I am now. But that that little, I would say, two-month window from April, May, end of March, April into May was tough because that's when I was staying with my dad. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I didn't have my shit. I didn't even know what the hell I was going to do. So what did that lead to? That led to... Fast forward to my business now, but only re reason being is I was just there, you know, one day it was like, hey, my dad has some friends that are some gun, uh, gun owners. He's known him forever. Um, one's a firefighter, the other one just works alongside him. And they wanted to go shoot. They knew I was in town. I know him too, but so I was like, all right, let's go. Take me to your range. Went out there with them, had a blast, shot all their guns, and I ended up just teaching them. Just a couple things here and there, like how to hold it properly because they were all assed up. Uh, just the, the basics. So we had fun. I think literally that night I came back because before this, I interviewed at a couple jobs. Um, what other jobs did you interview with? I interviewed for another instructor job. Uh, I worked a security job for like a week and I fucking quit that. Uh, this other instructor job for firearms training. That was another uh that at the end of the day, I just didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And after that range day, I went with my friend, my dad and my, his friends. I was like, I could do this. It kind of like, I don't know, I just had like this epiphany, like slapped in my face. Like, I always loved and enjoyed shooting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if you ask any team guy who doesn't fucking enjoy shooting, because that's what we do. You know, we shoot all the damn time. Um, but I really enjoy it. Uh, it's a really good stress reliever for me. But and also, like, being a buzz instructor, that being a teacher and a mentor, I, that grew on me, too. I like teaching people new things and watch them grow into a better person, et cetera, new skill set. So that, on top of that experience, it kind of like, hey, I could do I want to make a business of this. You know, I could do this on my own. I don't need to go work for someone else who's already doing it, put my time and effort into that or some other company. I could focus my 100% of my attention and energy onto something of my own which I felt way more comfortable about. Yeah. It was just way, I don't know, I just, because I also wanted that freedom too. That's part of the, why the reason I got out too. Freedom maneuver, you know, being to do what I want, set my own schedule, just have a, a, a regular life. Have a family. Have a family, yeah, a good relationship. So working for someone else for eight to 10 hours a day, in an office or wherever, or standing doing security, I was like, no. Yeah. Yeah, there was no way. I tried it. <laughs> yeah. I tried it for the, one of those jobs for a week, and I said, I'm out. Because I just, and it was actually a pretty good job. But as, at the end of the day, I was like, hell no. I couldn't do it. So the business idea dawned on me, and I just went full force into it. 100%. That night, literally, just me and my dad brainstorming. Because he, he started his own business, too. And he has a successful one. So he, on top of that, mentor, again, fast forward to today, now he's sitting there mentoring me on business too. Yeah. So it was kind of, cool. kind of funny to see how all the things worked out like that. Um, but then I invented this company, the company I have now. So and I've been full force with this. So Kennedy Defensive Shooting is born, and it's a brand new company, just a baby right now. I mean, I think that's what pulls a lot of guys out of the um, the darkest part of the transition, which a lot of times, um, you know, 
leads to suicide, um, addiction, all that kind of stuff. Did you, actually before, did you deal with any of that before? Living, the last year, like when I was at Trade Debt, part of the reason why I got out because, I mean, I was single, no intention. I was like 100% focused on work. And every time I was out drinking all the time when I was home, even on trips, I would be out fucking drinking every weekend. I just saw where I was going while I was still in like the last year and a half or so in my personal life. I didn't want that to continue, so I knew I needed to separate myself. Because I was all I cared about was work, and then when I didn't work, I just was home, partied all the time, I drank. Fighting? Yeah, rarely, occasionally. I wasn't like a fighter, but I would just go out and booze all the time. Yeah. Um, and then just fucking wake up with hangovers every fucking day, three, four days a week. And I was like, the fuck am I doing? Yeah. You know? Not getting anywhere, just just repetitive. And then rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat every trip. Yeah. And it just, it took a toll, dude, for sure. And I saw where I was going and where I would go, too, because if I stayed in, I would have just probably continued to do that. Yeah. And just push kind of, I had some friends, but I just, relationships, if I wanted family, probably wouldn't have happened because I would just care about work because I was always so fucking nervous to, like, be gone. Yeah. I always wanted to be there and be that guy. Like, I would let everyone else go. I wouldn't even come home for, like, <laughs> holidays because I was like, I didn't want to leave. Holy shit. So I was like, I just want to stay. So do you think that uh, your business kind of drew you out of that cycle? It did. It gave me, I, I'd say it did, it did give me purpose. Because once I got that, that bug, that, you know, that dawned on me, I was like, all in front sight focus on it. it pulled me out of that rut you know I was still at the time still living my dad you know but I was like all right run it got the name started doing all the back end stuff established the website and just kind of just building somewhat of a business foundation so I actually get out there and get clients it's a new addiction yeah it's, it ended up being a new addiction for me and now it is still addiction yeah you know? but I mean a lot me of guys of Sorry, go ahead. It did bring me out of that hole, like you said. Yeah. That, before that, I was literally just sitting there in my dad's house, like, twiddling my, my fucking thumbs, like, no purpose, no, no reason to even be there. It's like, I'm just sitting here because I'm a bum. Yeah. It's, it's almost, you know, I see a cycle, and this is my own theory. It could be just a bunch of shit. But, you know, what I see, what draws a lot of guys out of that downward spiral, uh, which a lot of times doesn't end well. Um, you know, you're, you get the addiction to adrenaline being a seal. You're kind of like, just like we talked about, you had over 180 fucking engagements, you know, in less than a year. And <clears throat> you become addicted to that. And then that addiction, a lot of times, I believe, gets replaced with drug addiction and yeah. alcohol, which are also coping mechanisms. And then, just from my own personal experience and watching guys like you and other close friends of mine, the business becomes the new addiction, which pulls you out of the, 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 the drugs and alcohol a lot of, and, or adrenaline. And uh, I mean, and you're fucking crushing it now. You're already training Huntington Beach SWAT team, which is incredible. Yeah, that was a that was kind of a surreal experience for me. The the city I grew up in. Now I'm training their SWAT team. Yeah. So and those these season season officers too, not young. All of them probably had six seven years on me. Yeah. What do you what would you say your most challenging um, thing is in business right now? It's client acquisition. Yeah. Getting new clients and just. In content creation, it's constantly just in, grow, in developing new ideas for growth. And I, I always, I don't want to just be stagnant. I don't want my sole purpose just to do in my business just to do private lessons. Yeah. I want it to be a little bit. I want it to be bigger than that. And can, it can be. I just. Do you have it, any idea what you'd like it to grow into? I would like to grow into more. We're in the works of developing some courses um, to expand outside of just privates. Possibly doing group classes, 
um, 10 to 15 people and are in multi-day courses, which I'm developing now with one of my close friends of mine. Um, and then work more with law enforcement too. I w I'd like to work with a lot more law enforcement, um, maybe a little bit more heavy on law enforcement, a little less on the civilian. Um, I got more fulfillment out of training the HP SWAT than I did, you know, not to, it's just those, in my mind, people like that, they need to learn the skills mm -hmm. that I have to offer because they don't get it enough. Yeah. Hands down, you, any department, SWAT or not, like they don't get to behind the gun enough. You're either SWAT or you're not. Or you're not. <laughs> <laughs> but that's in my, that's true. You know, like I train cops on their own dime. They, you know, they come to see me and pay a private lesson from with me. Not, they're not getting the department paying for it. They're paying for it out of pocket. Um, so focusing more, maybe I can work with more departments and work with them. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely understandable because training a law enforcement guy, I mean, he might, I mean, shit, he might put what you just taught him into, or at least has a higher chance of putting what you just taught him into a real world situation, like within a couple hours. Exactly. And, uh, and I'm sure a lot of them probably do, but <clears throat> well, Travis, I know you got a flight to catch. Is there anything else you'd like to cover before we wrap this thing up? No, I think we touched it all. Um, again, thank you uh, for your mentorship. And I attest your mentorship and advice to the majority of my success in my business in the beginning and even to this day, brother, seriously. Um, so thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank yeah. you for coming. and. I don't think, after the experience you just shared with us, I don't think you're going to have any fucking problem filling an open enrollment course or finding uh, private lessons or training law enforcement uh, in any part of the country. So, uh, guys, check Travis out on Instagram. What's your handle? You can find me at TravisKennedy267 or uh, Kennedy Defensive Shooting as well. And you're starting a YouTube channel up as well. Yeah, YouTube channel, like Kennedy Defensive Shooting, Facebook, and then website as well, KennedyDefensiveShooting.com for all the information. Well, I'll be sending uh, everybody I know over there. So I just want to wish you the best of luck, and I want to thank you for coming out. And uh, I know some of that stuff that you shared is not fucking easy to do, and I just want you to know that me and the audience really appreciates it. Yeah. And uh, thank you for your service. Thank you, brother. Appreciate inviting us. It's been a true pleasure being here. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.